All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's a beautiful summer night to be standing indoors at a public hearing. It's uh, welcome to the public hearing. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. Um, this is the Oak Bay's public hearing. I'm Kevin Murdoch, the mayor of Oak Bay, and I'll be chairing tonight's uh, public hearing uh, for proposed bylaws 4732 and 4733. I'll start off by acknowledging that we are in the traditional territories of the uh, Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations and that their con connections to these lands continue to this day. Uh, before we begin, I just want to advise that this public hearing is being live webcast and the recording will be archived uh, on the district's website in future. So personal information including your image and personal opinions may be collected and disclosed as part of council proceedings on the video. When presenting to council, if you're acting as a representative of a resident of Oak Bay or speaking of another party, please ensure you are not disclosing any personal information about that person or for which you don't have any consent to do so. Um, I'm, this is a slightly more formal uh, start to these meetings as part of our uh, efforts to, to uh, clarify some of the, reg the rules around uh, public hearings. Um, just a quick overview of our protocols here. Uh, I just want to outline some of them for tonight's public hearing. I just ask everyone, uh, let everybody know that anybody wishing to speak at the public hearing will have the opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm going to ask that people limit their comments to five minutes or less, uh, uh, and there will be opportunities to come back a second time if you wish, but we won't restrict anybody's ability to talk. Uh, we just ask that comments be respectful of council, the staff, and uh, of other members of the public. Uh, please direct all your comments to me as mayor and chair, and uh, they should relate to the related and proposed bylaws. And once everyone has had a chance to speak, uh, those wishing to speak again may do so. Uh, the purpose of the public hearing is to give council an opportunity to listen to the views expressed by the public. Uh, the public hearing is not intended to be <laughs> the opportunity where you're learning about the details of the application. Uh, there are details available uh, through the previous minutes of the previous meetings and presentation and the staff reports that are available. Uh, for the informa information of all of you present here tonight, uh, a public hearing binder is available uh, with all written submissions and is available for review if anybody wishes to comment on those submissions specifically. Uh, as chair, I do reserve the right to uh, conclude any presentation made by any member of the public or council or the staff that does not relate to the proposed bylaw or is disrespectful towards any other person um, or if you're repeating points uh, that you've already made. Finally, council members are here to listen to the public's opinion on this with an open mind. No one here uh, has prejudged the outcome of this application. And I'm just going to go, uh, you'll see on our agenda, this is again a new format for us on the public hearing agenda, uh, trying to lay out a bit more specifically what the process is. Um, but we'll step through the numbers one through seven. Um, the planning staff will introduce the proposed bylaws. A motion will be made to receive written submissions um, uh, that were provided and distributed prior to the public hearing. You'll then have written submissions provided to the district after 3 p.m. Uh, that are not included in the agenda and uh, will be read aloud and a motion will be made to receive those. The applicant will have the opportunity to present their proposal. The council will have the opportunity to ask clarifying questions and members of the public will be invited to provide comment on the bylaw. And then a final call will be made before we close down the meeting. Uh, we then recess the public meeting and uh, council will then deliberate in future. I just want to point out, uh, oddly enough tonight, um, we have a tradition of dealing with uh, a land, significant land use issues that we have all councillors present. And you may notice that we're missing a, a chair here on the left-hand side or your right. Uh, so Councillor Zelk has unfortunately got caught. There's been a major accident on the highway and he's stuck in that. We don't know when he's going to arrive. So procedurally tonight, I've confirmed with members of council that everyone's uh, here on next Monday. So procedurally, we're going to have the public he uh, hearing here tonight on 602 Newport. Uh, council will not be deliberating the, this item until uh, next Monday, uh, at which point Councillor Zelka will have had a chance to, to review the minutes of this meeting, uh, and then we'll take, uh, consider a third and final reading and adoption at that time for consideration. So we'll get through all of the public hearing, please don't leave, uh, but it, we actually won't uh, have considered this, this item until uh, next week. So just give you a heads up on that so you don't get shocked and surprised. Uh, and that's, um, does it, all of Council understand that? Oh, clear? Okay, sorry. It's the first time they've really heard it as well. So um, thank you very much for coming out tonight. And with that, we will kick off the, uh, the, the, uh, the hearing here or the meeting. As, uh, so I'm just uh, item number one on our agenda. If I can just invite the planning staff, uh, Ms. Jensen, to introduce the purpose of the bylaws 4732 and 4733. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Uh, the first item on this evening's agenda is bylaw number 4732, which is a bylaw to consider a heritage revitalization agreement for 602 Newport Avenue. If adopted, it would retain the residence in its current location and require ongoing maintenance of the home. It would also facilitate a two-lot subdivision of the entire site with one single-family dwelling located on each proposed lot. The existing home would continue to be accessed from Newport Avenue and the new proposed home would be accessed from Linkley's Avenue. The process to designate this home is running concurrently through bylaw number 4733. The existing home at this address was designed and constructed by the Craftsman Company Limited in 1930 for Oswald Dorman and his wife Clara. The residence is characteristics of a Georgian revival style with its broad hipped roof, stucco cladding, port cochet and multi-paned wooden sash windows. Through the revitalization agreement, zoning bylaw requirements would also be relaxed for minimum parcel sizes, lot frontage and lot width, and paved surface for both lots. For the rear and exterior interior side lot line setback for the existing home, and for the front lot line setback for the proposed home. As part of the agreement, the owner will enter into a covenant to be responsible for ongoing maintenance of landscaping within the Linkley's Avenue Boulevard area. As well, more than 15 new trees are being added to the site, bringing the tree canopy cover up from approximately 15% to the targeted 35 to 45%. Given that bylaws 4732 and 4733 are running concurrently, it may be appropriate for Council to receive input from the community on both these bylaws at this time rather than separating the process. Thank you very much, and we will do so. Uh, next up, we have uh, written submissions that were provided to us in our package. And with that, uh, is there an updated agenda just so everybody has had a chance to, to see that? Your nope. Worship, there is a, an updated agenda, and I think that our staff are rapidly trying to upload that as there was uh, a very significant amount of correspondence that was received today. Not for this, but for another item. Is there, uh, I'm just seeing it here now, so it is loading up. Um, uh, so we'll consider that. Um, so we need to have a motion, but I would actually like people to just refresh their agenda packages. Most of this correspondence is not related to this item, I understand. There was significant correspondence for uh, both the item tonight on the public hearing and uh, one later on council. Okay, so just as well, we're not going to consider the, the item here tonight, and we'll have a chance to read those. So we will read all of the written submissions that are provided to us. So has everybody had a chance to refresh? Yes, we're all good. Okay, so with that, can I have a motion to receive the written correspondence? Move received. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, unopposed. Um, next, we have reading of new submissions. So these are submissions that were received after 3 o'clock but did not make it into the written agenda package. Your Worship, there was none. There's no more. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, we have the applicant presentation, so I would invite the applicant to present the proposal. Uh, where would you prefer people to stand for the presentation? There's a slightly different setup at the, ch at the table. Why don't you do that? And if you have your uh, architect or other member here, they're welcome to come up at the same time. That's the, the mic is live, so just feel free to. If I can just ask, uh, and I'll ask everybody the same, uh, if you could just state your name and the municipality of residence before you speak uh, for the record, and then uh, please go ahead. Pat Battle, Zoak Bay. Um, your Worship, Councillors. I've been the owner of 602 Newport for the past 31 years. I have sensitively updated and restored the home over the years, but it is now time to downsize. If I were to sell, the possible outcome for this property is that a much larger new home will be built, as the existing footprint is small in relation to the lot size. So I'd like to preserve this home and garden as it is well designed, enhances the Newport streetscape, and has a rich social history. Many of us have seen friends move out of Oak Bay in order to find a one-level home with an easy care garden which permits pets, for example, as they prepare for future mobility issues and caregiving needs. While designating 602 Newport as heritage, I hope to build a two-bedroom accessible home facing Linkley's, which I can live on one level. It will have provision for a lift to an area for a caregiver in the future, but for visiting family more immediately. 
a woodland garden also accessible as planned. Native plants, generous tree canopy, including adding five Gary Oaks, edibles, and as well as beneficial insect and bird attractants will be planted. This garden will be able to cope with climate change and avoid regular gardeners' visits so there would, as there will be no grass to cut. This will improve the present view from Linkley's as the backyard of the current house has much asphalt and a garage built decades later than the house itself. With the bus stop only a few doors down at Central and Newport, this new home and garden should not only provide me with many years of enjoyment, but will fill the needs of others in the future. I've been encouraged by the outpouring of support from those who share my vision of a sustainable and inclusive community. Um, I'd like to introduce John Kay and Nicole Parker and uh, Jess Gallerton back there, and I would like to thank them for their hard work that they've done on my behalf. Thank you, Ms. Battles. Mr. Kay, mm. did you? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I believe there's a PowerPoint in here. Can we switch? Yeah, let's trade. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Hopkins. Sorry, I'm a Mac person. <laughs> uh, Your Worship Council, my name is John Kay. I'm the architect for the project. Uh, I live in Victoria. Uh, this is a uh, site plan for 602 Newport, an aerial photograph. The uh, uh, Newport Avenue is on the right. Linkley's is on the left. The existing house is toward the uh, Newport end of the uh, picture. There's a garage, which uh, Pat mentioned, toward the rear of the property. Our intent is to uh, uh, undertake a heritage revitalization agreement, which includes designating the house and uh, a new uh, dwelling on Linkley's. The intent of this was to construct a new uh, retirement home, uh, including provisions for aging in place. Uh, the building is scaled to permit the existing house to uh, dominate the site. The lot would be subdivided, as uh, mentioned. Uh, one thing I would like to mention is, I, in my view, there's been ample opportunity to have this reviewed by the community. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting with a good turnout. That was last September. Uh, the signs have been up for since about that time. Uh, I think this, uh, this uh, application has been well publicized. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> Missing one. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there is a street view of Newport, but Newport is uh, remaining unchanged, of course. This is a view of uh, 602 Newport uh, taken from Linkley's. Uh, we're very aware of the rural nature of Linkley's. As mentioned, Pat has lived there for over 30 years, and uh, I think we all share the concern of this uh, pretty unique street in the middle of Oak Bay. Uh, its narrowness, uh, lack of sidewalks, uh, bad pavement, which produces automatic traffic calming. Uh, I think it's a very significant element in the community. Uh, we've had um, several meetings with uh, parks and engineering regarding underground services and any changes to the boulevard and to the street width. And uh, uh, what you will see later on in the presentation is a result of those discussions that we were responding to. Uh, their direction. I'll be brief with this data sheet. Uh, the bottom right is the kind of where the key numbers are. Uh, site coverage is uh, well under the uh, maximum allowed for the new uh, lot at 22 percent, 30 is the maximum. Uh, building height is well under the maximum. Um, there is uh, one interesting statistic in this, and that's the floor space ratio, which is 0.395. It's just under the 0.4 maximum. Uh, this is due to the uh, uh, attic and the open ceiling living room area, what I would call an atrium, uh, being included in the FSR, and it's just a product of the Oak Bay planning bylaw. They are, of course, not actual floor area. Uh, without these uh, being considered, the FSR is 0.31, which I think is quite low. The usable floor area in the, in the house is uh, 1,957 square feet, and the atria and attic uh, add another 520. So I think there's been 
some confusion in the community about the actual area of the house and I, I believe this explains that. There are variances uh, primarily for setback and paved areas. Uh, these variances have been considered in developing a landscape plan and uh, uh, I think ameliorate uh, any um, limitations on the normal setback requirements. I would like to uh, also mention the, the house does have a small footprint as I mentioned before, uh, 0.22 of the lot coverage. Um, and there are also, subdi also subdivisions on both Linkley's and Newport. Uh, these have been done over a period of time. So this is not a new uh, intrusion into the community. There is a, a history of, uh, of these subdivisions. I don't know what the history is, but they're there and they seem to have fitted into the community. So the uh, plan view of the subdivision, the uh, property line is roughly slightly toward Linkley's tending toward the middle of the site. Uh, the proposed lot A, which is, contains the existing house, has uh, no changes at all. Uh, the driveway, Port Cochere, uh, the house itself uh, are unaltered. Lot B, uh, which is the new building, uh, uh, sits more or less where the uh, current garage is located uh, in terms of setback. It obviously has a larger footprint. Uh, the driveway access is, uh, matches the current driveway. There is a um, substantial boulevard on Linkley's, which is a product of the narrow street width uh, that shows to the uh, left of this uh, uh, illustration. As Deborah mentioned, the house was constructed in 1930, the existing building, uh, by the Dorman family and is a good example of Georgian revival, very symmetrical. Uh, I think an attractive building. It's uh, largely unaltered, uh, which is, I think, remarkable. Uh, it's in excellent condition and uh, is an integral part of the uh, uh, Newport Avenue streetscape. Uh, we had a statement of significance uh, and a condition report uh, prepared. Uh, we worked with uh, Don Luxton and Associates. Don is a well-known restoration consultant based in Vancouver and did work here early on and is very familiar with Victoria. Part of the uh, request of council and as part of the designation process is if this is successful, the house would be uh, uh, seismically upgraded and we're, we're fine with that. So this went to the Heritage Commission and uh, who uh, motioned approval. So the uh, landscape sketch, um, uh, Pat is using a, a landscape designer named Rob DeGro, who I think is known in the community, and he came up, his instructions were to produce a woodland garden, uh, heavily planted. Uh, the area, the rear yard now is mostly grass, so a, a fairly benign environment, and we're trying to uh, redevelop that. There are no trees being removed. There's one sycamore at the uh, bottom right of the new lot, uh, which is protected. Uh, there are some small shrubs which will be relocated. Uh, the instructions were to provide privacy to the existing residents, uh, the existing house, and the adjacent neighbors, and uh, of course to conform to tree coverage requirements. We had, uh, as I mentioned, uh, detailed design on Linkley's. Uh, there's a removal of invasive species, mostly ivy. And uh, the new planting consists of native uh, uh, plant material, native mock orange, uh, ferns, uh, kinnikinick. Uh, one item I would like to mention uh, in terms of uh, access to Linkley's is the uh, uh, driveway apron will be gravel screenings. It will not be pavement. So I think that uh, contributes to the rural nature of the, uh, the Linkley's and, and the new building. Uh, this is a set of floor plans for the new building. The main floor is on the left. Uh, I won't dwell too much on these. There is um, uh, a couple of issues. Uh, I think the idea was to produce a compact and highly resolved dwelling, which is appropriate to uh, the, our client's space requirements and potential future accessibility needs. The house uh, uh, opens very much to both front and rear yards to allow uh, uh, access to gardening, which is a major interest of the, of the client, and to take advantage of sunlight at different times of the day. 
Uh, one, one issue which has affected the design a little bit is clearances for accessibility. You can see some circles on the drawing, and those are uh, uh, turning radii for uh, wheelchair access, in, including in the bedroom, master bedroom, in the bathroom, and in the kitchen. So they, they do have the result of adding some space to the uh, footprint of the building. There's also provision for a lift, and that adds a little space as well. I mentioned the uh, uh, issue of the FSR. The uh, height of the central living area is an integral part of the design, and I, I use that from time to time to make a small uh, building feel larger by combining the upper and lower floors and by rather than building uh, square footage to build in a little more height into the building. These are exterior elevations. Uh, the colors, I can assure you, won't be those. Um, anyway, there we go. Um, our intent here is to have high quality materials, naturally, uh, with uh, uh, a minimum of maintenance. To that end, we've uh, specified a standing seam metal roof, which would actually be kind of a gray or kind of zinc color, I guess. Um, there are some uh, cement board panels as accents, which are the darker uh, blue panels on the elevations. Uh, the remainder of the house is uh, pebble dash stucco, and that's uh, done intentionally to relate this building to the uh, existing house, which has the same finish. Uh, privacy has been uh, considered as well. Uh, there are windows on one end wall, but uh, they've been kept to a minimum to maximize privacy to the neighbors. Um, generally, the build the uh, glazing and outdoor access goes to the front and rear yards. Perspective. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up as a, I guess, a concluding statement. The, uh, the subdivision of this large lot is in accordance with the growth strategy for Oak Bay for sensitive infill development. Uh, there has been some conversation that this uh, project would set a precedent. Uh, I don't believe it does. Um, the existing house is designated. There may be, and also, of course, the property fronts on two streets. There may be a couple of other examples of this, but I think they could be treated as this should be on an individual basis. Uh, and now I'll turn to the community plan. Uh, I think this proposal strongly reflects the goals of the OCP, and I'll, I'll work through those. Uh, the first goal is work toward climate change mitigation. As we all know, we're in a climate emergency, and the result of that is we can't continue to throw away the embodied energy in an existing building, which has got an unlimited lifespan and is ex in his excellent condition. A small house, on a, at the same time, that building, because it's quite small and because it's on a large lot, uh, is very unlikely to survive in our current economic environment. The uh, second issue, uh, and they're, they're related, is to conserve uh, neighborhood architectural heritage and ambience and to conserve Oak Bay's built heritage. And I think uh, uh, those statements are pretty clear that we're, we're following those guidelines. Uh, the next one is, uh, and this relates more to the new house, although I, I could include the existing house, is to support diverse and inclusive housing options. So we're providing... Uh, by retaining the existing house, a somewhat more affordable family-style house. Uh, with the new building, we're uh, providing a housing option for, I would say, empty nesters or people like that, uh, allowing aging in place and another way of fitting into the community. Uh, another uh, aspect of the uh, OCP is to consider infill development to allow more density within neighborhoods while conserving neighborhood character. And I think, uh, I think this project does that in spades. I think uh, uh, the increase in density is not large. I, th I think the conservation aspects are, uh, are clear. The OCP also mentions specific innovative approaches to housing, including second dwellings on larger land parcels. Uh, along with that, it points out that the population growth in Oak Bay is an older demographic unlikely to be looking for large two-story residences. And I think we're trying to uh, 
I think we're trying to present a model here of a type of housing. Uh, I mean, it's unique and it's, of course, in its own way, but it is providing a model of how infill might take place in Oak Bay. But to conclude, <coughs> um, this project increases housing options, including affordability and inclusivity in the community by retaining an appropriate sized family home and adding a residence suitable for aging in place. We believe this is an appropriate way for the community to increase housing options, combining heritage preservation, new infill, and a housing type which answers a need in Oak Bay in terms of size and adaptability. Thank you, Mr. Key. I just turn to council now. Does council have any questions uh, for, or for clarification either of the applicant or of staff? Councilor Braithwaite. Sorry, I just could you just clarify for me the actual square footage of the house? I, I think I read somewhere that it was 1,700 in, in some document, but I thought I heard you say that it was 1,957 plus 520. I believe that's correct, yeah. 1,957 plus 520, thank you. Are there any other questions of clarifications? Uh, I just have one question for clarification of staff, and that is just the uh, a question of width on Linkley's Avenue itself. There's some question about the widening included of that, uh, of Linkley's Avenue uh, included with this application. Can you, I think I'll turn this to staff. What's, what is the, what is the widening that's proposed here, uh, and why is that necessary? I'll turn to Mr. Haran, who's Director of Engineering. Yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, so the, uh, when anal analyzing the requirements for the the road, we also consider um, the whole aspects of we would would for any um, application related to subdivisions, so subdivision development bylaw, so all of the services to service the new lot, which include underground infrastructure, but also the road itself, so from lot light to lot line for the property. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about it, that stretch of, uh, of Linkley's Avenue, uh, which is currently, it varies through the through that area, uh, but uh, just under five meters at this point. So, in a typical situation, we'd be looking at a street that would be significantly wider. But in this in this area, what we're trying to do is achieve a minimum uh, standard where uh, two cars that are approaching each other head to head in the middle of the night would be able to pass side by side. So that's where the the minimum in this case of uh, five meters. Um, was it was uh, arrived at? Thank you, sir. And, and how wide is it now? Do you have that? Just for comparison, it seems to be Ms. Jensen. So currently, uh, the existing road right of way width is at eighteen point two meters, which is actually a little bit more than what we were looking at for the, um, as eighteen meters for th for the entire road right of way. The paved surface itself varies quite a bit, as Mr. Rand mentioned, going down Linkley's Avenue. In front of the uh, this particular property, it ranges from approximately three and a half to four and a half meters. The proposal is five. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Patterson? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a, another question um, for clarification from, from staff. I don't know if it'll be from the Planning Department or the Director of Engineering, but um, the lot as it presently stands does span both Newport and Linkleus. And so the applicant as is presently entitled to have entrances to the lot from, from both streets. Um, so should the applicant, even on the existing lot the way it is, wish to um, perhaps expand the garage area? Right now it's a garage that looks like it has been unused for some period of time. But if it, they wish to do so and wish to have an entrance, would the, um, the drive would probably still have to be expanded even to accommodate that type of addition, would it not? to Ms. Jensen. I think it's more of a driveway question than a road question in that situation. Sorry, I just want to clarify. So you're asking if they wanted to build a garage on the smaller lot facing Linkley's? Well, I, what, I'm, what I am trying to ascertain is right now, because the existing lot does span both streets, you could actually um, 
enter the, the present lot from both directions if you wanted. The laneway has developed over time, it at least appears to me, uh, because that portion of the lot has not been in use, but has, if it was put into use um, and, and the applicant wanted to, to have um, another accessory building that was used all the time, that would still require a review by planning department as to um, entrance from Linkleus even to that part as opposed to what is there existing today. If I can reframe the question just so I'm clear, the question is if if there was a I would say replacement garage built, mm -hmm. that would there be any would the current driveway suffice or would that have to be require changes? Mr. Ferrer? Yeah, through Chair, so we're we're just having a quick discussion to make sure that we're answering the right question. Uh, I think the question is, uh, so separate from the application that we're talking about tonight, if this was a completely separate situation where the, 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 the homeowner is looking to have uh, another way to access the lot as it currently exists, um, could there be a driveway that accesses from Linkley's Avenue? That's the question. So that would be uh, like a, a separate question that would come from the driveway access bylaw. So similar to uh, there are some... Um, some rules and, and guidelines in that bylaw about how much paved surface you're allowed to have, how many driveway accesses you're allowed to have, uh, and variances of those uh, come to council if they need to be changed. But I haven't looked at this particular situation from that perspective, so I can't, I don't think I can weigh in right now about what would actually happen in this case. Thank you. Can I? Councillor Patterson? Uh, and just another, another question um, on this, um, and it comes from the presentation. I note that. Uh, the combined total footprint of the two buildings on this lot are less than the potential could be for a lot of this size if it was not developed. Is that correct? Calculators out. Where's the, uh, have, you, uh, have you done that, that math? Looking at lot coverage or floor area? I'm really looking at lot coverage because I think that's that's what uh, many people are concerned about is uh, there's been a discussion as to whether the, the two buildings take up um, a, 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 a larger portion of actual coverage on the lot itself and based on what I've read in the application and the, the drawings presented, this actually, with even with the two buildings, takes up um, less lot coverage than I'll ask the other questions. applications we've seen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, staff, Ms. Jensen. Sorry, there's been some going back and forth here, so I want to make sure I'm answering the right questions. So you're, to, to clarify, if the lot continued in its current use and if they wanted to extend what they have on the lot, what could they do? No? No, what's no, the... No, sorry. I'll, I'll reframe the question. So. <laughs> What is, is the, uh, is the uh, combined existing house plus proposed new house lot coverage uh, equivalent to more than or less than would be allowed if the lot was left as a single lot with a single family home built upon it? Okay. Could I try and answer that? I'll get it from staff just because I think it's it's probably appropriate to get the number. If you have it top of your head, I guess I can let you. Uh, close. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I'll let them answer it. They're they're just doing the calculations now. a harder question than we anticipated. I'll answer half of it while he's crunching the numbers on the other one. 
So as one single lot currently with the RS2 zoning, you could have a maximum of 30% lot coverage, which would be just over 400 square meters, which would give you an FAR uh, floor area ratio of uh, 535 square meters. The total for the two, if you take them at point two, just for rounding it up, is approximately uh, uh, taking the total lot is 1337. The uh, total uh, site coverage would be 266. So there's quite a substantial uptick for a single family house or a placement house. I think, that, is that what you're trying to get to? No one uses calculators anymore. That's the problem. follow up. Uh, if you look at the two lots com uh, as separate lots, the numbers work out exactly the same, 401 square meters for lot coverage. That's what's allowed for the two lots, but is there, do we know what the two buildings combined actually make up in terms of lot coverage? We're so looking to compare what the two buildings as proposed are compared to what a single what family home would be allowed to be built on that lot. I, I can answer this. Okay, I'll turn to Mr. Key. Um, currently on the single lot with the existing house, the site coverage is 11.6%. With the subdivided lot, uh, the coverage, site coverage goes to 20%. The site coverage of the uh, new building on the new lot is 22%. So if you take those as averaging, say 20%, because keep the math simple, that gets to my number of 266 okay. square meters. So we're, we're, we're at about 20% lot coverage and, yeah. and allowed on those two lots to be 30% if it was That's a single right. home. That's what you're trying to get to, I believe. Which yeah. is significantly lower than 30% yeah. that, that would be allowed if yes. you just looked at it as a lot that was a, a vacant lot that you were developing. So That's correct. the two houses combined are significantly lower than a single house could be on this lot. That is correct. Well, just... Stick with the, uh, anything else, Mr. Patterson? The, this uh, question I have is really um, about the agreements themselves and uh, they, it would be to staff. Um, in future, if there were any proposed changes to the heritage designated house, um, any proposed changes would still have to come back to council under the terms of the HRA, correct? Ms. Jensen? If the owner of that home was proposing to do something that required a uh, building permit that's affecting the heritage characteristics of the home, yes, it would come back to council through heritage alteration permit. Thank you, Mayor, and for the patience of the staff. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilor Green? Yes, thank you, and through you, Mayor, to staff. Um, one of the concerns is the environmental and sort of rural ambiance of, of the lane or street on Linkley's. On the Linkley side, I just wondered, could you tell me what the impacts of potential paving might be on the vegetation that currently exists? Uh, Mr. Horan, I don't know if that's an uh, answerable question. Through you, Chair, I'll do my best to, to, um, to answer how We've looked at uh, at the, this question for this particular application in Linkley's Avenue in general, um, and and unfortunately, so I'll start with with a couple of things and end with with a statement on environmental impact. Hopefully, that'll answer your question. Um, if you stand on uh, Central and look south along Linkley's Avenue, um, what's happening underground there is on both sides of Linkley's Avenue there are storm mains underneath the ground, and they are far enough to the edges of the road which uh, in many cases they go it goes underneath and through it's basically in the boulevards so underneath a lot of the vegetation underneath um, driveway accesses all the way along Linkley's 
in the middle of Linkley's Avenue, there's a um, sanitary sewer and uh, that basically follows the middle of the road. And then just to the west of that, in between the storm drain and the water main is a, um, uh, or sorry, it, be between the storm main and the sanitary sewer main is a water main. All of those are roughly 100 years old, built in the 1915 time frame. Um, so the reason why I bring that up is because this question about this particular property we're, that we're discussing tonight, it all uh, is reasonable and makes sense why it's being debated. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everyone has the same understanding of Linkley's Avenue in the future uh, as we look at what has to happen in that area uh, going forward, say, for the next 50 years. Uh, there will be a time, um, and it, I don't know when exactly, uh, but the, the, those mains, uh, all that underground infrastructure is now beyond its life cycle. It will need to be replaced. So as we consider what has to happen in that area, we just need to have that um, understanding of, 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 of what the future is going to look like. There, it won't, we won't be able to keep it looking exactly the same indefinitely. So back to the question of environmental impact of this particular question on the table tonight, we are aiming for just that lot line area to create, to, to do the paving for that, um, you know, lot line to lot line in terms of north to south and five meters wide in that area. So environmental impact would likely be, um, I don't want to weigh in if whether it's going to be minimal or higher, but it's, it's unlikely to cause any major changes because we're not making uh, we're not making the road much wider than it already is. I think the environmental question will be around uh, the longer term. What will this What will this avenue look like between now and 50 years from now? And supplemental question, please, um, Mr. Horan, through, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Horan, and Linkley's is defined as a street, a road, a corridor. Can you give us the legal definition of Linkley's, please? Um, well, our records show Linkley's Avenue as an avenue. So um, based on our, in, in, for in terms of the right-of-way, in the municipal right-of-way, the, the area that's owned, um, it's much wider than what's being talked about today in terms of the, pi the paving. In many municipalities, in situations like this, um, the municipalities would exert the full, um, uh, their full rights in terms of what's owned uh, and as they look forward 50 years for uses going forward. Uh, it includes exerting rights around encroachments, whether they're desirable or undesirable encroachments on the boulevards for the main reason that they impact what could happen later in terms of rehabilitating what's underground in terms of infrastructure. Um, I don't know, did I answer your question there? Yes, I really appreciate the clarity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Horan. Councillor Braithwaite and then Councillor Appleton. Um, thank you, and through you, Mayor, um, to staff, I believe also. Um, the al allowed paved surface area in the front yard, that is 25% paved surface. So I noticed that on lot B, they actually say front yard um, paved surface is 30%, so they'll have to have a, a variance for that, is that correct? And then I know that um, uh, it was mentioned that for the driveway you won't be paving, and that's probably because you'd have to increase that even more, so to from 30% because the driveway would be in the front yard, would it not? Would it be considered the front yard? Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that's why you're looking at the pavers for um, the for I'll, the driveway. I'll put that to Mr. Key. I think it still counts as paving, yes. Mr. Key. Yeah, I think the the intent of the uh, gravel screenings was to. Uh, soften the impact of the approach from Linkley's was not to uh, uh, that's out in the sorry if you could just speak a little oh, louder sorry, into the I'm microphone. away from the mic I'm sorry uh, the intent of the gravel screenings was to uh, soften the appearance of the approach to the house from Linkley's it was not to uh, uh, it, that's in the boulevard anyway so it would not affect the calculation uh, the calculation is in fact affected by uh, the driveway uh, once on the property and a patio and a walkway. Those are all counted as uh, as part of the percentage, and that's why we're over. And just uh, one other question. is there Are there any other um, variances that um, this um, application for Lot B would be looking for? I guess that's to staff. Ms. Jensen? 
Thank you. Uh, no, the, the variances are as, as are set out in Schedule 3 of the Heritage Revitalization Agreement bylaw. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Kay's comments regarding the paved surface. So the way the zoning bylaw reads when it speaks to paved surface is it's a hard surface. So that might be gravel, it might be asphalt, it might be concrete. Those are all considered the same under the zoning bylaw. In terms of the variances for the existing heritage lot, um, that variance is in there for the existing driveway. It's not that there's anything extra going in, it's for the existing um, scenario. For, for the proposed lot accessing off of Linkley's Avenue, uh, staff actually decided to take the, the worst case scenario on this one because you do retain the RS2 zone, which has a larger setback for its front yard. Um, the RS5 zone is a shorter setback and that's what the variance is based on. We took the, the just over 7 meters to calculate the front yard area and that works out to the 30% which is the variance that's being asked for. The RS2 zone, if we applied that, there would be no requirement for a variance. It would come in at just over 20%. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and through you to staff. Uh, just picking up a little bit on some comments that Mr. Haran had made, I, I was curious, just in terms of the servicing that would typically be required in a, in a subdivision situation, I'm just referencing this, the section in the report that talks about working with the applicant to, deserve, to uh, determine the services that would be required. And so I, I'm just wondering, maybe just for the edification of the people who are present, uh, what type of services would typically be required in a subdivision situation, um, you know, so I, I understand the concept of the road widening, but are there other things that would typically be uh, enforced in this situation that are sort of deliberately being uh, omitted or at least uh, reconsidered in in light of the specific situation on Linkley's? Mr. Horan? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, in uh, other subdivision and development situations, like different ones than the ones tonight, uh, the the typical um, the the bylaw requires us, and, and we we do this where uh, all the, the full breadth of the scope of the requirements of offsite servicing. Uh, it's hard for me to get out how I just tried to explain that. So what we require is uh, so in the, from the uh, along the frontage of the property that's proposed to be subdivided, the offsite servicing is uh, is is updated water main, rehabilitated uh, sewer and storm mains. And then um, uh, sidewalk and road until the uh, the center line of the road is is what's usually uh, allowable under the um, uh, the subdivision development bylaw. In this case, because it's being considered under uh, heritage revitalization agreement, there is some flexibility to relax some of those. And then the requirement uh, to make the road up to the standard, which is as a minimum for a local road, because the OCP designates Linkley's Avenue as a local road. Um, so instead of um, 8.5 meters, we're saying instead of the minimum for a, a lane, which is 5.4 meters, we're saying 5 is acceptable for this road. But that is making an exception under this um, HRA kind of uh, analysis. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, just thank you, Your Worship, and again through you to staff. Uh, just picking up on something that Mr. Haran mentioned earlier, are, are there any issues anticipated with... Uh, making service connections from essentially new service connections for a new building into infrastructure that, um, as you mentioned, is, is quite aged. So I'm just wondering what considerations are, are, uh, are in place for that. Mr. Horan? Uh, through you, Chair, that's a good question. Uh, I think that the question is the same uh, and the answer is the same for all of, the, all of our subdivision development type of scenarios, so it's not necessarily a, a something that drives a decision in this one. Um, we do uh, have to consider because we the subdivision development bylaw only allows us to affect the inf to to ask the developer to pay for the infrastructure upgrades along the frontage of the property. Um, sometimes there's conditions or situations downstream from the property which uh, which affect the uh, uh, the the use of say the there's maybe there's a capacity issue or maybe there's some other uh, situation. So in this case. Um, uh, it's very no it's it's an it's a normal situation for us to look at not just what's in front of the property but downstream uh, to assess the impact of a potential development on the rest of the system thank you thank you very much uh, and with that I think there's no more questions of the applicant oh Councillor Patterson 
If I may, Mayor, just ask one more question on this. The, um, the bylaws that are proposed really deal with Lot A and the, the heritage building, protection of the heritage building, and the designation of the heritage building. Could we clarify, please, what documentation we use to provide certainty that the applicant completes the construction of the new dwelling and landscaping uh, substantially as is proposed in the plans that are presented? Ms. Jensen? Thank you. Uh, typically, what we would do is attach it to a siting and design covenant through the subdivision process. Council has seen these regularly. I anticipate it would be very similar. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to get to the public here, so uh, I think we are exhausted our questions at this time. Uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, you are welcome to come back at, at a later time in the evening if you have just questions raised that you wish to respond to. So at this time, I'll just invite anybody wishing to speak to the items in front of us to come forward to the microphone. I believe we're coming to the stand-up microphone, is that correct? Uh, where we have a timing light for five minutes to give you some sense of time. Uh, again, your name and, and comments will be recorded in the, in, the, in the streaming. So just come forward. And if you can just also write your name and municipality of residence on the sheet, that way we have the right spelling for, for the record going forward. Um, it's helpful if you have a clear opinion, if you want to state that you're in favor or opposed to the application, uh, and then provide your comments. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Um, can you hear okay? Yeah, Kristen Giel, Oak Bay. I do live on the street, uh, just a few doors down. Uh, so I'll be honest about that. And I think a number of you know me as a heritage ad advocate and um, someone who cares deeply about the green spaces in our community. And um, despite how seductive this might feel, I just can't support this project, not just as a neighbor, but because of the subdivision. And that's what I came to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very concise statement. Thank you very much for that. Uh, anybody else wish to come forward and address council? Please come forward. We, or you can form a short line if people want to get up and talk. Hello, my name is Wynne Miles. I live in the 600 block Oak Bay. Actually, my family and I have lived there for over 30 years. I just had a question. I submitted a letter on July the 4th and today because I didn't see it on the um, submissions for today's meeting. So can I be assured that it has been added? Or? Yes. So okay. the July 4th one is because of our late agenda piece got added here late and on, okay. on, I think agenda today. So I won't repeat that because I think uh, most of that's been said with regard to the HRA and, and other specifics. But what I wanted to speak about today was um, <laughs> tell a little bit of a short story about Island Road in that Island Road and Linklius are often mentioned together as part of the walking path that many members of the public uh, use. And as I said, uh, we have lived there for over 30 years. And back in 1987, the 600 block of Island Road looked a lot more like Linklius than it, it does now. Um, Island Road was a gravel road. At some point in the next few years, it was suddenly paved. We weren't asked or consulted, it was just paved. We were disappointed and others were too. As one of our neighbors said, we paid for a country lane. You know, <laughs> so. Um, when we moved to Island Road, the development of the Todd Estate was in progress, and we were pleased, and that was done very well. We were pleased to see the communal area of the Todd Estate located closest to Island Road because that gives a setback from the houses to the uh, Island Road itself, which, as I say, is used as a walking path for many people. In 1992, after much community discussion, the Elkington Estate was developed. After statements, and I'm going to be very brief. So. After statements about developing four, 11 lots versus final six and rooting the service lines up Calvert Crescent, which is now a path up to the park, and opening Calvert Crescent for vehicle access, a group of 80 or so community residents came together as the Friends of the Anderson Hill to lobby council with regard to their preference for the development. In the end, a portion of Calvert Crescent was closed and became part of the estate Three of the 11 original lots were purchased, replaced the closed portion, and added to Anderson Hill Park. Calvert Crescent was not developed and remains to this day as a forested trail to Anderson Hill Park and part of the Centennial Trail. 
During the construction of the Elkington Estate, the existing vegetation along Island Road was impacted, and in some areas, for example, across the street from our house, paved um, gravel pad, I mean, sorry, gravel pads were laid out for the parking of the construction vehicles. It was very busy, as you can imagine. Uh, the paved area was widened in some areas, and it was noted that people drove faster when it was paved, when it was widened. Letters were written and promises were made that the vegetation would be reinstated, and it was, although it took a number of years. So in the 32 and a half years that we have lived on South Island Road, eight new houses have been built. One large but very tasteful addition has been added, and recently one new lot divided off. The point I want to make is that infill can happen gradually, be insidious, and builds on past changes. One of the main problems I have with the proposed development on 602 Newport is that it sets an expectation, or you can say precedent, that the Heritage Revitalization Agreement automatically allows for rezoning and a subdivision. As I understand it, the HRA process and rezoning are not con necessarily connected. And just um, from what I heard um, during the architect's presentation, when, or actually it was, I'm sorry, I don't know this gentleman's name. <laughs> the Director of Building and Planning, Mr. Horan. Oh, Horan, okay. Um, they were saying that the, it would have to be widened to allow two cars to pass safely. On Island Road, um, it isn't wide enough for two cars to pass, but we have pull-offs, you know, in strategic places, and people use driveways, so we just use courtesy to allow people by, and that way it doesn't have to be pa paved uh, wide. And also, um, with regard to future paving or widening for the various services, I don't see any reason why it, the vegetation couldn't be reinstated up to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would just ask that people don't uh, cheer or boo or clap. Uh, just We want everybody with the different opinions to come forward and feel safe and comfortable here. It's just to be respectful of all, all speakers and all opinions. Uh, would the next speaker like to come forward? Good evening. My name is uh, Bill Robertson. I live in the lower part of Linkface Avenue, so 790. I've lived there for over 30 years. Um, just to give you some historical things that have happened, and I support this subdivision, by the way, uh, the house that is currently at 588 on the west side was moved to its current position in order that the house a house could be built at 572. There is uh, a new house was built, it's quite bigger than the one proposed, at 622. This is again on the west side. And then a lot was subdivided on island to create a lot on Linkleus, that's 648. So there's nothing new about the development that has taken place on Linkleus. And uh, as far as the services are concerned, I don't think that one additional house will make any difference to the sewer, the storm, or the water. So for those reasons, I think this application should be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just please come forward. Pat Wilson, Oak Bay. I'm Welcome, Ms. Wilson. I'm particularly interested in why it has to be five meters. I live on Brighton. I happen to be at Brighton and St. Patrick and went through nine months of destruction on St. Patrick. Ms. Wilson, can you just can you oh, address anyway, your comments I was, through to me, not to the staff? I lived through the nine months of destruction and reconstruction and dust, and it's finished, thank goodness. But Brighton Avenue, I went out and measured it today. It's 150 inches, which is like 3.8 meters. I don't under, and we pass, we get two cars through there. You know, it's, it's a lot of people walk there and a lot of cars go along that. I don't understand why we would pave the front of this lot, the 100 feet, particularly if we're going to be tearing it out, putting new lines of whatever, sewage or whatever. It just somehow, why isn't this grandfathered in? It's the way it is. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Wilson.
Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vern Bigden. I'm a resident of Oak Bay. This application has generated a lot of correspondence. I started keeping track mentally and then I realized I needed to map them. So I mapped all letters that included addresses made public until noon today. Hence, I'm respecting personally identifiable information. I did not know that we could use the wall-mounted screens, so I brought my map on paper. I would like to thank my assistant for holding it up. <laughs> um, I did not include all of Oak Bay in the map. I kept it to the nearby neighborhood. There are 42 pink, pink lots on the map that are opposed to this application. There are four green lots on the map who have indicated support, although I note that one of them actually said that they weren't in opposition. I scored that as a supporter. That's greater than a 10 to 1 ratio against. It would have been 45 instead of 42 opposed, but the Langpaps moved east and Mr. Sutherland Brown and Vincent Holmes have both passed away since signing the petition in opposition. Then if we expand our view further abroad, as the majority of the applicant support comes from outside the neighborhood, we then look at the colored dots, and I apologize, they're a little smaller than I would like, but you can see them as red and green. There are 18 red dots opposed, and there are five green dots in support. That's over a three to one ratio opposed. So in total, if I count up the lots and the dots, there's 60 opposed and nine in support. That's a seven to one ratio. I might presume that, that staff provide you folks with a visual representation such as this, but I wasn't sure, so I thought I would bring it up myself. Thank you so much, and thanks to my assistant. My name is Pat Kale, and I live at 641 Newport, and I've lived there for 26 years. For the past five years, I have been working to protect Linkley's Lane from development. At the beginning of each council meeting, the mayor acknowledges that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples and their historic connection to these lands to continue, continues to this day. It is 2019 and we must act as stewards of these lands. We've just had an election in this past year. We know that you share our values because you said things during the election campaign that reflects the values of the citizens of Oak Bay. Preserving the environment is very important to all of us. The neighbors have shown overwhelming support to protect this special area and we now ask Mayor and Council to dismiss this HRA application for 602 Newport. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kell. Don't be shy, come on up. I'll go first. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Jan Mears, Oak Bay. Um, I've served on a number of uh, committees in this um, community, including the OCP as an advisor when I first moved here. I chose to live in Oak Bay because it's a beautiful community and we have many treasures here. We will change over time. I see a lot of brand new homes with paved front yards, double car garages. None of those come before this mayor and council for discussion. We see a lot of uh, loss in terms of our, our uh, green space, in terms of our tree canopy. Um, and I know that is a very a big concern to a lot of people. I think this application is actually brilliant for our community. I think it allows gentle densification, which is the only kind of densification we're going to see in a built out community such as Oak Bay. It's a shame that every time an application like this um, 
comes uh, forward that it has to come to council, that it can't be discussed at the neighborhood level first and can't be considered in other places so the neighbor's concerns can be heard and incorporated. But I do think that this applicant and the architect have done a brilliant job for Oak Bay and I hope it is not a precedent setting model but a role model for others in other parts of our community and I don't believe there will be a lot of opportunities to do this but I think it is one form of gentle densification we should support. So I urge you to support it. Thank you, Ms. Mears. Please come forward. I hadn't intended to come forward. My name is Vicki Turner and I live in Oak Bay. Um, I'm a retired realtor and I have followed uh, uh, real estate matters in 13 municipalities in the Vic Victoria, Greater Victoria area and I specifically came to this uh, hearing tonight because I thought it was an extremely interesting concept that this landowner is attempting to pursue. I think she should be encouraged. I'm for it. Uh, she is designating the uh, appears to be designating the original home to a heritage de designation and using part of this large lot to build a retirement home for herself and I totally agree with the speaker before me that, the, that this is bringing density to Oak Bay and is really not offending anybody. I, I really would like to ask the uh, council and the people in this room, would they rather see both the, this home torn down and a huge new home built because of the area of this lot and the potential footprint of a huge home? Because I would imagine if this is, does not go through, that that's exactly what will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, just stay there and speak into the microphone. This will be fine, sure, yes. that's okay. Uh, my name is Robert Campbell and I live at 588 Linkley's, which is just behind the house that we're talking about that wants to subdivide their lot and add the second house. Um, I'm opposed to the application. I'm very opposed to it um, because it would allow the new house to be built. And, would be, and I, I believe, in spite of what's been said tonight, that it would be very detrimental to the attractive amb ambience and the wildlife habit uh, along our Linkley's, Linkley's Laneway. I also know that dozens of my neighbors along Linkley's, along Newport, along Island, uh, Island Road, and even some on, uh, on Central have all sent you letters now, and I know they're all opposed to it. So, you know, the figures that were just mentioned uh, before about, what was it, a 9 to 1 or 12 to 1 or something, that's, that's what I think it is. Everybody, just about everybody's opposed to it. So I'm therefore asking you, Mr. Mayor and councillors, to do the right thing and deny the application at 6, uh, 602 Newport. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. June Beatty from Oak Bay Central Avenue. Um, I see this as a win-win. I think a lot of time, effort, and money has been spent developing this application, and I think it's fantastic. Would you mind just yeah, write down your name, please? If Thank I have you. Right spelling. Thank you. Uh, anybody else wish to come forward and speak? Thank you. Uh, my name is Wendy Amos, and I've lived in South Oak Bay for 42 years. And I walk this neighborhood extensively. I'm currently on dogs number eight and nine as companions. And I can be a little bit long-winded, so I did choose to read my notes tonight. Um, I love Oak Bay. I've lived, as I said, I've lived here for 42 years. I love the variety, the mix of old and new, the natural beauty, and the gorgeous gardens. And the walkability of the area is a huge bonus for those of us fortunate enough to live here, and especially in the area of Anderson Hill. It's always a draw. I have submitted a letter in favor of this proposal, 
and I just wanted to take this opportunity to underline a couple of points and to respond to some of the comments I've seen online from the letters um, submitted previously. Pat Battles is proposing what seems to me a reasonable subdivision of her property and the construction of an imaginative house that will support her and subsequent owners to age in place. There have been some references in the written submissions to the supposed financial advantage she would gain from this application, and I can't imagine that this will be so, and I don't think that should weigh in the discussion. She will eventually be selling a house with a significant covenant attached, and I'm assumed that that will lower its value. And in addition, the process of applying for the HRA is itself quite costly. This is money she's invested without any guarantee of success. While it might be commonplace in a developer with deep pockets, I think it should be noted that this is an application from a longtime resident with a demonstrated track record of appreciation of the history and heritage of Oak Bay. And I think she should, she should be commended in having spent the last many years of her life trying to pursue this. Some of the comments and concerns relate to the potential impact on Linkley's. I don't live on Linkley's, I live on Victoria. But as noted, I know the area well. I also remember the development of Anderson Hill and the Elkington Estate. I've made it my business to pay particular attention in view of the neighbors' concerns. The drawings and plan for the proposed new structure show a house that's been well designed to have minimal impact on the streetscape and having read the Arbor's report three times and walked Linkley specifically to check, I can't find that there is a major threat to the trees, inhabited by owls or otherwise. In fact, the Arbor's notes that there will be a net gain of canopy. A related concern expressed, and it's been brought up tonight also, is that this proposal, if approved, many more will follow. The thin end of the wedge arguments um, are always attractive, but they're not always compelling. I don't believe that that will be the case in this instance. My understanding of HRA proposals is that each one is designated to be um, considered on its own merit, and I believe that the Heritage Committee and Council should be trusted to do so. I'm going to add the next paragraph. I considered long before whether I would say something about this or not, but it does has disturbed me, and so I will add it in. When we choose to live in a collective, the rights of the individual are at times necessarily subject to the good of the whole. Deciding on the good of the whole is not necessarily the purview of a few people of passion. I think it's unfortunate when neighborhood disagreements such as this lead to tactics that are less than civil. And in this instance, I understand that misinformation was dispersed and several people who subsequently subsequently contacted Pat Battles, learned that the full story was far otherwise than they had been led to believe. The Friends of Linkley's have spearheaded the opposition to this proposal and apparently involved in the distribution of incorrect and misleading information. And the members of the group have been at the forefront of collecting signatures on petitions and in offering to write letters for others to sign. Not form letters, which are often used as adjunct petitions, but letters that can be personalized, giving them the weight of independent thought. I think it's sadly we can all be lured, myself included, into an emotional response without checking that the facts presented are correct, but I hope this will be taken into consideration when we're in the submissions and the number um, of for and against um, letters. I can't resist adding my, my recent focus attention on Linkley's also led me to what I thought was a rather ironic discovery. At the point where Linkley's narrows to a single lane, there's a large double garage with a fully paved driveway from the setback to the street proper. To my eye, it was the most blatant impact on the treed and shrubby aspect of Upper Linkley's and adds hardscape to the lane. It's attached to a house on Newport, but the driveway housed a display of posters opposing the HRA. Everyone, of course, is entitled to their own perspective, but I did think that this was a little bit rich. Your Worship, it's your and the Council's unenviable task to try to balance the rights of individual and the community. Under the current guidelines and bylaws and in line with the views expressed by many of the Council during the previous election, there seems to be every reason to support this submission and I very much hope that you will do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will be short and sweet. Um, I'm a neighbor on Newport. Uh, we've only I've only been in Oak Bay for four years. I love it. I think it's an so amazing sorry, can place. Sorry, just get your name. That's Tacey McLagan. Sorry. Oh, thank you. And um, we love it. We walk everywhere. We think it's a fabulous neighborhood. I think that this um, particular uh, application is brilliant. I think that we need to have more places for people to be able to age in place in neighborhoods. And I think that if we if we get rid of people because they can't live here and they have to go elsewhere, the neighborhood loses. And if we allow people to do this in this respectful way, I think we all win. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Next. <laughs> uh, Frank Wilson. And I should write that down, shouldn't I? We've got a good one. Appreciate people managing to retain some humor in a, <laughs> an hour and 15 minutes into a very I warm I think you're evening, doing very so. well, Your Worship. Thank you. I live um, just four doors down from the property we're talking about. I've got no objection to this proposal. Um, we live locally. Um, as I've got no objection, in the context of this kind of meeting, and it's difficult for members of the council to interpret, I listened to the comments on statistics and the number of pros and, and against. You know, you councillors do know, you always have to bear in mind the people who don't care either way. And they tend not to come to these meetings. Do they not? However, um, I respect the different opinions. I just hope we're not going to have dissension on the street. I enjoy, for the first time in my life, having close neighbours. I lived in the middles of farms and fields for much of my life. And I appreciate the neighbourhood and I hope we don't lose the good neighbourliness that is around. These things can happen in this kind of case. Our streets are pleasant, typical Oak Bay mix. Let's remember it's a mix. It's already a mix of large and small. It's a mix of properties that some would regard as perfect and some which are waiting for demolition and replacement. And that applies to properties within the stone throw of, of where we live, at the bottom of this street. Change is all part of what, what happens. We've only been living in the area for 12 years and it's remarkable how much change there has been in that time. How many properties have changed hands very close to where we live. We never thought it would there'd be so much uh, mobility and so much change. Less than 200 yards away from the property that we're talking about tonight are two new developments. Look at those developments. Look at the size of those developments. Now, whether they will be in keeping with local architecture is debatable, but is everything in, in, it always in keeping? There is change. And I think what we have proposed here are things that have got a good chance of being in keeping because one will be retained and the one that is proposed will be made to be as far as possible as defined in keeping. Speaking of the other ones, one of those new developments just up the road is so large that my young uh, grandson thinks it's a hotel. <laughs> and I think most people know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't think the proposed development diminishes the ambiance and the amenity of those of us who live on Newport Avenue and enjoy, and enjoy Linkley's. It does not, in my view, run counter to any articulated council policy as existing. I see it as a reasonable infill with good intent. And by the way, that garage will be no loss at all. It is not an architectural gem. <laughs> Alternatively, we may lose the existing property and who knows what will replace it. Finally, don't worry about the owl. Please don't worry about the owl. <laughs> I'm a farmer's son, I'm a country boy. Owls are remarkably resilient beings. And I've even consulted the local ornithologist on this and he, he emphasizes that owls can cope. Don't worry about the owl. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I wasn't aware we had a local ornithologist after. I'll put you in on my, from my Rotodex. my name it takes a little bit longer yes. so my name is Peter Joachnecht uh, I live on Bing Street resident here in Oak Bay for the last 15 years um, I took a few notes here on my phone just listening to everyone and the presentation um, I'm very much in support of this application um, mainly because of these following points um, it is a large lot facing two streets which in itself is you know wonderful and unique actually uh, to have a subdivision that faces two streets it's quite ideal 
um, two homes on two streets is uh, kind of a no-brainer. Uh, the application is retaining the existing home and well designated as a heritage building, which is definitely a gain and win for the community. We don't have that often that homes of this quality can be retained. Um, no trees have to be removed, which is also quite unique. Usually trees are in the way and have to be replaced with others. Um, there's a large boulevard along Linkless, which will retain most of the well, if not all of the uh, existing canopy and, and um, vegetation. Um, Upper Linglis is a street with other homes of even much bigger scale, as we've heard before. Uh, the new home is providing an important addition to our old and very slow growing housing stock. Aging in, in place is one of the biggest challenges in our community. Uh, this application is dealing with this issue in a very sensitive and appropriate way and will free up a heritage home for new owners like a family. In my opinion, a number of high quality proposals similar to this application is exactly what Oak Bay needs to increase density in a sensitive yet effective manner in residential areas. We can densify in these areas meaningfully so we can add a home here and there. We have other areas maybe where we can have higher density, but not here. Um, this is a perfect proposal for a lot and location and deserves appreciation and full support by council. In addition to this, don't have those notes, but I, I picked up on some earlier comments and I, I, I do take offense by some of the flyers that have been distributed in our neighborhood. And I think um, we have to respect other people's opinion. Um, if someone is sending out a flyer, uh, have the decency to put your name under so that we can engage in, in, in conversation and not hide um, under some acronym or um, <coughs> other name. Um, and don't distribute something that is not accurate and uh, create, creates like a very divisive um, energy in our uh, community and neighborhood. So we have, um, I think, something very special here and we have to be very civil about how we engage uh, and those flyers um, do not help. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johanet. <laughs> we'll all have a chance to come yeah. forward. So. But I do appreciate people being uh, reasonably brief here, it's allowing us to get through a large number of these, uh, these comments. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Alan Little. Um, my wife and I have lived in our home on St. Patrick Street for 46 years. It's uh, on the Heritage Register, and we appreciate anything that residents do to preserve homes worthy of being on the register, as this one is. We think this is a very sensitive and sensible project. We fully support it and wish there were more um, projects of this um, quality that are being offered. We're horrified at, at the thought of what could go on that lot and we truly uh, will appreciate your support in approving this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Little. Hello, my name is Stephen Atry. I live in Oak Bay. I have a degree in botany, a master's in biology, and a PhD in plant biotechnology. I am also a licensed realtor. I will begin by saying I am in full support of the Heritage Revitalization Agreement for 602 Newport. <coughs> 602 is a wonderful looking house that is an asset to Newport and has a rich history. The front of the property will not be altered. Uh, I too have been dismayed by some of the signs and handouts going out with misleading information. Um, these have been delivered through doors, including mine. The information is the very opposite from what seems to be being attempted by the applicant. <clears throat> I had a conversation with Graham Buffett from Building and Planning and wished to clarify some points. The first 
um, points I will deal with are mostly on one of the leaflets that was sent through my door. The, it comments on the loss of Linkley's as a safe, walkable, low-traffic rural lane. Um, as far as I know, the truth is there are no plans to build a highway down Linkley's. Uh, the traffic will not change, um, or barely perceptibly, um, that it would be unnoticeable. Another point, loss of Linkley's character with street widening and paving. Um, as I was led to believe, the widening is for approximately five metres to provide a passing point for traffic, making it safer. <coughs> Me. The loss of laneway ambience for hikers, bikers and walkers. The truth is the ambience will not be changed. It will remain a laneway. Um, it comments on less rainwater absorption. It is my belief that the new development will have a rainwater retention system which older houses do not have. This will result in more groundwater absorption rather than diverting it to the storm drains. Increased traffic roadside parking. I ask from what? Where will this increased traffic come from? Will people from Souk or Sydney say, oh, let's go for a drive down Linkley's <laughs> now that they've added a, parking sp a passing spot? <clears throat> Loss of habitat, including wildlife, owls, hawks, eagles, butterflies. The plan is to replant with native species and to bring the coverage up by greater, and I mean greater, than is currently present. It includes the planting of five more Gary Oaks than presently exists. <clears throat> this, pre this development plan is precedent setting. I am not sure what the president is. Uh, I noticed a similar proposal for Ireland. <coughs> Any presidents are positive. It is mentioned that the subdivided lot will have 2,700 square f foot two-story house. As far as I'm aware, it will be approximately 1,120 square foot footprint and a 1.5 story home built. <clears throat> As pointed out by others, the applicant has put in a great deal of effort and money to preserve this home. I see no downsides, only upsides. I walk the lane most days. If this project fails, there would be li little to stop a developer from knocking 602 down and building a large square box home in its place. Is that what people prefer? Not only would this... <coughs> not fit with most people's appreciation of architecture, but nearby residents would be subject to construction, probably lasting several years. 602 would still have access to Linkley's. I turn my attention to another leaflet, hand delivered to my door, titled, Who Will Speak? Well, I am speaking. This leaflet refers to the California quail, fawn lilies, and the owl. The California quail... I'm just going to remember, my just right. Your five minutes is done. You've, please wrap up your... I've, I've got a couple of lines now. Okay, thanks. The California quail is um, non-native and was introduced. Cal uh, the uh, lilies, fawn lilies, are abundant on Anderson Hill and in Uplands Park. You cannot blame the applicant for the loss of on Linkley's for these, as so far she has only put up two notice signs. <clears throat> I hope uh, the, the owls, as been pointed out, will benefit from the increased Gary Oaks. I hope the points I put forward will help council in their decision. Pat should be congratulated and praised. Well done, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Lattery. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak? Please do. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Loren Charlton, and I am a 39-year resident of Oak Bay. Um, I've lived on Island Road since '86. Um, I've submitted a letter that details the reasons for my support of this project, um, the uh, HRA to allow a, a building of a value to be retained, and the subdivision of the property to allow a long-time resident to age in place. Um, I note that one of the leaflets distributed stated the house will be uh, a large house, uh, 2,700 uh, square feet, uh, and that trees would be removed, uh, and that the road it gave the impression the road would be widened um, for the full extent uh, and paved over, um, and the urban forest would be destroyed. Um, the house, as the previous speaker had said, uh, is going to be uh, 1,900 square feet, uh, excluding the garage. Um, we've heard that no trees will be removed, and the road is to be paved between the, um, in front of the uh, current property and where the proposed house is uh, to make up the difference from the current 3.5 to 4.2, um, give or take a couple of um, milliliters or whatever, um, to five meters, just for that period of time. So. Uh, period of, um, of the extent of the road, so it will only affect at this point in time that um, part of the road in front of the property in question. And I note that the property uh, uh, south of the, the property that has the proposal forward uh, does have a, a pull-in in front of that property in front of the hedgerow, which is set back, so there is already uh, a, a property that has something that is um, probably about five six feet pushed back. Um, so the addition of the uh, small area of paving would not be considerable. Um, I have note that some of the letters that have um, been submitted earlier and then on the uh, amended letters uh, reference tree removal, um, street widening and paving, uh, and the large houses reasons that they're opposed to it. Uh, and this information is incorrect. Um, I have stated in my letter that the subdivisions on Island Road previously and on Linkley's have not destroyed the ambiance of the area. Uh, and um, I, I, I see walkers and birders and bikers and cyclers still going up Island Road all the time and Linkley's. Um, Oak Bay uh, began, I see uh, one of the other letters states that Oak Bay began with five tracts of land and so we all live on subdivided land at this point in time uh, and I fully support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come forward and speak? My name is Patrick Fry. I live on uh, Oliver Street. I've lived on Oliver Street for uh, since 1982. Um, I was I had uh, the good fortune to be the manager of policy for at the time that uh, the current heritage legislation was developed, and uh, the uh, HRA tool was one of the tools that we provided to local governments. Um, the tool kit that we provided under legislation was fulsome and uh, would be uh, allowing for the development of a, a, a project just like this. So I'm speaking in support of 602 Newport. This is exactly the type of development that we envisaged when we were developing the tool of the HRA. So I would just like to say that I'm, it's very simple and I'm just going to say that. Would, Mr. Fry, would you mind just writing down your name as well? I think we know how to spell it, but just in case. Is there anybody else who wishes to come down?
<clears throat> My name is Kelly Wright. I'm a resident of Oak Bay. And I just want to address the, uh, the road widening aspect. We've already heard from uh, Mr. Horan that, uh, that the road will be widened in the area of the subdivision and that he sees in the future that the rest of the Linkley's will be widened as well. There's no question this is a slippery slope heading towards widening of a country lane that we do not want, speaking for myself, obviously. Uh, what I say to Mayor and Council is please heed Oak Bay's official community plan, which focuses on the importance and the protection and enhancement of the urban forest. Linkley's is such an urban forest and includes a Gary Oak Meadow at the north, at the south end. The Oak Bay community, the official community plan outlines the many benefits a healthy urban forest offers and states tree canopy decreases as urban density increases. Densification will have an especially a significant effect on Linkley's urban forest. If you remember, the public consultation related to the Oak Bay Heritage Plan asked respondents to identify Oak Bay's most significant heritage values. The number one heritage value was established streetscapes and neighborhoods, and this was cited by 66% of the surveyed respondents. Uh, the Vancouver Island Trail has its, uh, has its tra southeast trailhead at Anderson Hill Park. Imagine a hiker making his way or her way to the southeast trailhead. Uh, they would likely take a bus. They would get off uh, basically at uh, Central and at Linkley's and take a walk up Linkley's from Central Avenue. What better introduction to Oak Bay and the Vancouver Island Trail than having a healthy urban forest that they walk up? The Oak Bay Heritage Commission acknowledged 602 Newport had heritage value. However, the commission has all, had also uh, some serious concerns for Linkley's future as a country lane. What they stated was the rural view of Linkley's could be impacted dramatically. And secondly, they said the impact of the single subdivision might encourage more subdivisions along Newport and Linkley's corridors. People are saying this is just one development along Linkley's. True, it's one development that is, is going to encourage more people to subdivide. We know that there are people on the street, there are the green marks that uh, that uh, Mr. Bigden held up that are just waiting for this to go through so they can subdivide their lots too. Honestly, I'd rather see a, a large house put on that single lot than divide the lot and put up two large houses. Please reject the proposal to prevent these impacts on Linkley's. I recently spoke to Mr. Stuart Stark, one of two consultants who prepared the Oak Bay Heritage Plan. He told me, and I quote, I personally think that Linkley's Road is one of Oak Bay's treasures. It should be recognized as such and protected. Please ask yourselves, is this house at 602 Newport so important you want to push other community values aside? This is what you're doing. Why are the mayor and council considering a jump from RS2 to RS5 in this proposal? This is a significant change in zoning and it's smack dab in the middle of an RS2 neighborhood. Please seize the opportunity to maintain the special urban forest in Oak Bay by rejecting the development proposal at 602 Newport. Thank you. Thank you. Same routine. Just. My name is Pat Battles. I live on Linkley's Avenue in Oak Bay, and I'm in the unique position of having the same name as the applicant for the <laughs> HRA. And therefore, I have been implicated in some of the flashback for this project. <laughs> I would like to register my support for the HRA development proposed for 602 Newport. I spoke at the council meeting when the Committee of the Whole met on July 17th, so my approval is on the public record. At that time, I spoke of the value that I see in ensuring that the visible architectural history of these homes in Oak Bay can be maintained. As it happens, because I live on Linkley's Avenue, this gives me two reasons to be interested in this discussion. I am the Oak Bay Block Watch Captain for Linkley's Avenue, so I know the street very well. I'm a dog owner and routinely walk my dog up that section of Linkley's. 
I certainly sympathize with the concern to maintain the lane-like aspect of what is usually known as upper link lease. However, I find it very hard to believe that the development proposed by Pat will lead to the dire consequences predicted by some of those opposed to this proposal. Repair and replacement, as mentioned tonight, of sewage and storm drains are necessary given the aging infrastructure in Oak Bay. I am sure that Oak Bay will consider the importance placed by the public on the rural feel of Upper Linkley's when this work is done in conjunction with this development or otherwise. Having read on the Oak Bay Council website all the documentation, including with this proposal, and from speaking with Pat, I understand that the process of completing the application was very rigorous, to say the least. With that in mind, I think that the re recommendation of the Heritage Committee should not be ignored without a, a lot more hard evidence of potential harm. As a resident of Linkley's myself, I am very upset with the behavior of the Friends of Linkley's during this process. Personally, I think it borders very close to harassment. Circulation of anonymous documents with misinformation is not a, a useful way to deal with a project like this. Regardless of the outcome of this meeting, and I don't think this is possible, but I'm going to say it anyway, I would like to see Council address the distribution of misinformation to try to rally support for a particular point of view so that future applicants are not subjected to this very upsetting ordeal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Battles. Is there any, the other Ms. Battles? Is there other, uh, anybody else who wishes yeah, to come forward others. to speak? I'd like to speak at the end if I could. You, you would be welcome back, yes. Hello, my name is Anita Wolf. I'm a resident of Chickawich, which is also known as McNeil Bay and Beach Drive and Transit. Usually I'm coming here for Shoreline, but I'll talk about ecosystems as well. Um, I don't know what is involved exactly in the restoration of the ecosystem, should you go ahead with this development, but we are losing we are losing in Oak Bay. When I was a member of the Environmental Advisory Committee, the priority was how are we getting away? Can we get away from taking something down and putting up something new? And therefore, the recommendation of the Heritage Committee is really, really important. However, I think built environment can be rebuilt, redesigned. It's much, much harder to get an ecosystem that really reflects the values of, and the great, the great parts of Oak Bay. So um, I think this is an example where there's a contiguous corridor of habitat for birds and owls and eagles and also for people. But that contiguity, I don't see that happening in this development. And that's where the problem is, one of the problems, as well as, um, you know, I, don't, I just don't know, I envy your positions. You have, a, you always come up People are asking you to do tough things and make tough decisions on behalf of the whole community. My recommendation is look at your OCP. Look at what's in there. Look at the research that was done when we conducted the OCP. It tells you what people want. The first thing is the beaches. The second thing are the trees and urban forests. And then the third thing is heritage. So you have to figure out where the priority is. And the other thing I'm gonna recommend to help possibly make your job easier is that there be some kind of planning and design advisory committee that it really is integrated with the planning. We've had environmental advisory committees, we have heritage committees, we have different, we have had different committees. There should be one that really works with the planning and planners. You don't have a sustainability person on staff. Uh, you have, many of your residents are, we want to help you. So my recommendation is um, you, like, you guys are fighting house by house, lot by lot. This is, I was a forester. We fought the War of the Woods over and over and over again in every single watershed. So let's elevate the conversation, see what you can do for getting something that looks at you know, this a bit more holistically so you don't have to 
have roomfuls of people coming in and us being the watchdogs all the time. Anyway, I don't know what the right answer is. Probably an ecologist would be able to tell. And I, I know the last time I came to speak, it was at, um, I can't remember the exact address. It was 300 block King George Terrace. No, yes, 300 block. And there was a violation that took something right down to the shoreline. So another packed full room for that. Yes, there was restoration. And I walk that beach a lot. Yes, it is. It is good, and it could. It does approve. Uh, it is Green Shore certified. The problem is that there is. Um, we've lost the contiguous corridor, and so we just. You know, you just can't look at it like one little box at a time. Look at the whole thing, and I'll register my support for a planning or some kind of advisory committee, and you can call on me, and I have a half a dozen people on speed dial. It'll help you too. Okay, well, good luck with the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. My name is Ope, and my name is Bob Louie, 585 Linkley's. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> I am a professional forester and a soil scientist <clears throat> now retired. I was the former head of the Provincial Soil Conservation Unit, which provided technical information for the establishment of the ALR, the Agricultural Land Reserve. <clears throat> also, uh, I also provided technical information to the municipalities of North Saanich and Highlands for their long for their long-term planning purposes. <clears throat> Your Worship, two weeks ago I attended a council meeting to introduce a plan for the conservation of forested laneways such as Linkley's. At that time I had three minutes to present that plan but the buzzer went and I failed. So tonight I am back. <laughs> so. Canada has vast wilderness areas mostly in areas far from where we live. On the other hand, wilderness close to home at our very doorsteps are under increasing development pressure. These pockets of green spaces are slowly disappearing, slowly eroding before our very eyes. One of these pockets is Linkley's Lane. People know what a treasure we have. Yet over the recent years, its values has diminished. A subdivision here a variance plan there, a lane gradually widened. This problem has been growing all across Canada, not just here. But what to do? Finally last year, the federal government, our federal government in Ottawa, recognized the seriousness of this, of this issue and has allocated $1.3 billion towards the conservation of urban wilderness areas such as Linkley's Lanes. I repeat, $1.3 billion. So here in South Oak Bay, we already have such a wilderness at our very doorstep, Anderson Hill Park, the laneways of Linkley's Island and Transit. It's here in the private gardens of large and small subdivisions all around Anderson Hill. It's here on the foreshores of Beach Drive. We need to document what we have and make recommendations on how to improve it and to protect it for future generations. The concept of, of the con this conservation plan is in an article uh, published just a few days ago it was in the, the Globe and Mail. I would like to take this op opportunity to read three short quotes. Number one, conservation needs to start at our doorstep. Saving pockets of green space preserve endangered habitats. Number two, every property owner, even silly city dwellers with postage stamp sized lots, should set aside a fraction of their land for conservation. And number three, a decision based on land use subdivision is not looking at the big picture. It's important to protect natural landscape. 
That is the message from Ottawa, and I trust that you people will take it in. Take it in. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> if we can, if we conduct such a plan, I think it will take some time to do it. It will take money, but the money is there. Do we have the will? I don't know whether we do. You tell me. We do have an opportunity to bring back the quails. We do have an opportunity to bring back the fawn lilies. We can ensure that Owl will have a home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Louis. My name is Missy Albano. I've been a visitor to the land of the Laguancan people for the last 30 years. I live on Inkles. This year alone, there are five large trees cut on Nicholas. I took a year off to meditate. When I came back from my first retreat, my neighbor's house was going down. When that house finished building, the house in front of me went down. And a year later, the house perpendicular to me is going down, out on Nicholas Avenue. I'm speaking from the heart. I really want to protect the land. I want to become an ally of indigenous people who were here before, and I'm against the development. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Nicola Atri. I live on Bing Street. You heard my husband, the biologist, talking a little earlier. Um, I just would like to say that I'm in total support of Pat Battles. I think she's done a superb job in conjunction with her architect of trying to preserve the um, locale, the um, environment, and also promote uh, heritage homes, which I'm a big fan of. I am in no doubt that if this doesn't go through, what will happen, a developer will buy that property, will knock that house down, will build a big monster house, as is happening in two places on Newport already, there is a house at the top of that hill on the other side, as just before you go down to the golf course. I believe it's going to be 8,000 square feet. They're going to be blasting. They're going to be building an underground garage. I, I really personally don't like that. And I can see that happening where Pat lives. So I would much prefer her proposal to go through than the alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Atri. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is going to be a long night. <laughs> I'm Barry Anderson. I live on Central Avenue. Uh, gee, we've been there for 35 years. Time passes. Um, I was pretty impressed with the proposal as we heard it tonight. But there's no way that by putting more concrete and more construction on the lot, the ambience of the neighborhood will not be altered. And I, I think that the fear we've heard expressed here several times of slow incremental changing and paving over of the community is a process that's going on. It's part of the game that I guess council's elected to try to resolve. I do have a suggestion though. The Heritage Committee is looking at a building. It has a bunch of legal remedies to protect the building allowing a council to override its bylaws and so on. But nobody is looking after the streetscape, the environment, all of these other things. That's a bigger planning issue. And council has got an advisory planning commission. I don't think it's met for a year, maybe more. I personally, I personally would like to see this proposal referred to that commission and I'd like to see it go through a regular planning process. We found out about this thing three or four days ago. We had the weekend to construct a letter and send something to council. It's not a good way for the community to consider something, and it begets meetings like this. So I think the heritage process is a good one. It's not structured enough, and it's not broad enough to deal with community concerns, and it has no feedback to the community plan. If this is the way that we think the community should develop, it should be built into the community plan such that 
we don't have to have a variance on the community plan every time something like this comes up. And it's coming up a lot, as people have noted. So my thought for council, anyway. Thanks very much. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come forward? I have a quick comment. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just take first time speakers first, and then we'll come back to second time Absolutely. speakers. Anybody else wish to come forward? There we go. Don Wright. Resident of Oak Bay, I'm Welcome, not wishing to be in front of council uh, to be recorded. I feel very uncomfortable and had hoped I wouldn't find the need to stand here in front of you. However, I, I will start with, and forgive my nervousness please, I respectfully agree to disagree with many people here. Anyone who says no one is affected cannot speak for everyone. This affects the Oak Bay community. It, it, it affects Victoria, and it affects the visitors that come here. People walk, bike, bring their children, their grandchildren up Linkley's Island, Bing, as far as they can go and turn around, many streets of Oak Bay it's a treasure and it's being lost there is no need for this i i understand there's a, a your the council and mayor are um, attempting to have density uh, and meet the needs of everyone and it is not possible absolutely not possible to meet to meet every single need there will be disappointment on one side or the other but I disagree with changing the landscape of Linkley's. I would love to protect Island Road from any further destruction. It was beautiful. 15 years ago, Island, Bing, and Linkley's was the desirable, desirable neighborhood. I sought to move into it, and I sought for six years to move into that neighborhood as it stood as an urban forest, and it is being destroyed. I beg of you to consider the urban forest for our generation and future generations. I understand paving may have to happen to a certain extent. I understand that, that uh, water mains or sewers, forgive me if I'm not quoting that exactly, will need to be replaced in future. They do deteriorate. But I don't know that the, that you have to pave over it after that infrastructure is replaced. Again, I can only say I respectfully agree to disagree with anyone who wishes to change that street. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Uh, I will write on the back of Sure. The paper. <laughs> Need longer pieces of paper, apparently. Uh, anybody else wish to come forward to speak for the first time? Anybody else? Seeing... Uh, I'll take the second thing and I'll. Speak now or later. Well, I'll invite you up after the speaker if that's okay. You wish to come up for a second time? You don't have to write your name this time, just state it again for the record. Okay. Uh, Mayor Murdoch and Council, thank you again. Um, it's just two quick things. Um, from listening to all this tonight and doing all the reading on the web and thinking about it, it seems to me this is a great proposal, it's just in the wrong place. Okay. I, really, I feel strongly, like many of the others, that we need to protect Linkleus. Uh, it's uh, what Island Road used to look like. Um, the other uh, point was that a lot of people have spoken with regard to the pamphlet that was delivered, and I received both of them on Island Road, and um, I can't speak to the accuracy, but I was really glad to get it because I hadn't really, I didn't know about the project. I walked down link list and there's the big green and white sign and it never had a date until just very recently and all of a sudden it's a hearing. So I would hope in the future when you put up those signs that you can give the dates TBA when the first meeting is going to be held. Okay, So I appreciated the pamphlets. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody wish to come up and speak for a second time? That would include Mr. Key if you wish to come forward again. Mm. 
been a uh, very interesting conversation to me as a, an architect. I've been in Victoria all my working life, and uh, this wouldn't be my first rodeo as far as controversy. I think um, there's a couple of things I want to say to begin, uh, I guess in the sense of a rebuttal. Um, uh, this is not uh, in conflict with the official community plan. I said that earlier. There is several goals of the community plan, at least six of them, and this project of preservation, uh, infill, uh, sensitive uh, uh, increase in density in the, in the neighborhood is uh, absolutely what I think the OCP is trying to say, and I think this is an appropriate development. Uh, our instructions from our client, Pat Battles, were clear that uh, uh, the sensitivity to the environment and to her neighbor uh, were going to drive this project and uh, direct it. Um, a second comment was around timing. As I mentioned before, uh, there was a neighborhood meeting. Pat tried to notify everybody. Uh, there was probably 20 or 25 people there. I think the Jungle Telegraph works just fine uh, with projects like this. Uh, the sign, although it didn't have a date, has been up for months and it would have been readily available to City Hall to uh, find out a date. I think um, Linkley's is an interesting situation. We uh, had a camera uh, as a requirement by this uh, district. Uh, the sewer is basically collapsed. Um, so I, I think with respect, I don't think it's going to be 50 years before the street is dug up and some major renewal takes place. And that has nothing to do with this project. That is to do with the age of the services. Uh, it's, I assume it's clay tile and it's worn out. Um, I think uh, also dealing with link lease, we had uh, as part of the discussion around the house and around heritage with the Heritage Commission, an extensive discussion around link lease with, uh, with the committee, the commission. And we've also had extensive discussions with staff. And I think uh, people that reside in Oak Bay should uh, give their staff some credit for carefully evaluating this proposal, coming back with ideas that they felt would be acceptable in terms of the boulevard, in terms of uh, native plants, in terms of restoring that area. I've also heard about the urban forest. Uh, Pat Battle's backyard right now is a garage and a bunch of grass with one tree which is protected. Um, I think uh, the landscape design that has been produced is a far more complex mm -hmm. urban forest environment. If an owl is going to sit around, it's going to be over in those Gary Oak trees, which are not there now. Uh, so I think we've done what we can. And I think this comes back to what I've always tried to do as an architect, which is make an environment uh, a setting for a building. Primarily my work has been residential, which is more complex, not less. It's to try and integrate a new building into the community to preserve uh, heritage where it's appropriate. A lot of my work has been heritage related. I think, uh, you know, I'm very comfortable with what we've uh, put together here and I have to give Pat a lot of credit for directing us, uh, me and my, my staff that are there, uh, in how to approach this problem. Thank you, Mr. Key. Uh, and I will, this is still the second, people want to come up for a second time, this is the chance for them to do so. If you wish to come forward a second time, you're welcome to do so. No hands required. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Just a short statement. In Oak Bay, how many heritage homes are there? Of that number, how many have been designated heritage? In Oak Bay, how many forested laneways are there? Of that number, how many of those have been saved to date? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Louis. Anybody else wish to come and speak a second time? I wanted to address that the uh, pamphlet sent out has misinformation. The, inf the square footage of sorry, the... Can you just speak your name again for the record? Oh, sorry, Kelly Wright, Oak you. Bay. The uh, 
square footage on the uh, flyer is uh, from the K Architecture Limited's data table. The, there are a lot of exemptions that uh, are, not, are not included in the square footage. Those exemptions are for tax purposes and ratio purposes. They have nothing to do with the fact that the house will be 2,692 square feet. The house also uh, is uh, five and, over five and a half feet wider than the existing home on Newport. And it is proposed to be just four and one third inches shorter than the existing home when average grade to roof height is taken into consideration. This is not a small house. Uh, I'm, the, a biologist came up and said that uh, the, the area of uh, improvement of this proposed new uh, house on the subdivision will increase rain drainage, but uh, we already know that the paving of Linkley's will continue and that's going to far out the lack of absorption of rainwater is going to be uh, significant if the if link lease is paved. Uh, also, if mayor and council look at the safety of a single roadway compared to a, a, a road that can accommodate two cars going either way, study after study shows that a single lane is safer. So again, it was commented that uh, two-lane road will be safer. That's completely the opposite. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we apparently have uh, the sign-up sheet uh, has been picked up and somebody's picking up their papers. Uh, if somebody just checked their papers when they came up, if they have it, uh, we just need to have that back up here again. Oh, you got it there? Okay, thank you. Well, I've got one of them. There must be another one. You've got just there. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ms. Wolf, up for a second time. Uh, yes, Anita Wolf, just for that uh, point on safety. I'm a bit delayed today because I was on Oliver Street riding my bike getting here. My voice is a bit shaky because I got hit by a car on the way over. So I'm nursing some pretty serious wounds under these pants. But I think just to that point about safety, I don't think we have a wider street than Oliver. <laughs> you've got too big. Uh, you've got parking on both sides. You've got enough room to pass by and I still um, somebody opened up a door in, right in front of me so anyway just to that point <laughs> those laneways have so much value so many values you know um, for humans for four-leggeds for two-leggeds and if um, uh, to Mr. Louis's point how many of these kind of lanes have we saved and that comment Linkless looks like what Island used to look like. <laughs> so like when we lose it, we just lose it forever. And I'm hoping that you consider impervious, semi-pervious services for wherever you can for any of the roadways going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make a last call here for anybody else to come forward on this for the second time, second round of ask. I'm not seeing anybody else. So this is the, uh, I'm going to call for the third and final time for anybody who wishes to come forward. I'm just going to remind everybody that the public hearing, this is the final opportunity to provide council with your comments prior to the potential consideration of this proposed bylaw. So is there any additional written commissions to be included in the public record of the hearing? If you could just provide that uh, submission to the corporate officer now uh, prior to the close of the public hearing. And this is the third and final call for public input. Mr. Mayor, Council, good evening. It's been a fascinating evening listening. And uh, my name's Christopher Costin. Um, I recognize many people in the audience, and I recognize them not only from being neighbors, but I also recognize them from the fact that Council has dealt with these issues before. Let me give you a little bit of history to try and help because I am not here to tell you how to vote. That is not appropriate for a former mayor. What I think I can do is to help guide you by asking you to look at some of the things that have happened in the past and try to 
formulate your thinking around those things to come up with a solution that is in the best interest of everyone in the community. So I live on Transit Road. Actually, I live on, I've lived on Transit Road for uh, 33, 33 years. I can actually remember when I moved into Transit Road in the first month, there was a cougar, there, sorry, there was, there was a cougar warning up on Linkley's. And in fact, there was a cougar warning up there about three years in a row. So we can see how, how things have changed. In this room, there was someone earlier who made an application three times on a subdivision. The address, the address was 646, um, sorry, 640, uh, 648. Uh, Linkley's Road and I can remember same arguments and it was I thought as mayor I thought it was relatively easy to make that decision because there was a line where RS4 went to RS2 and there was a question of whether that line had been drawn in the first place after the third hearing that was approved and has worked well I'll refer you to another uh, application, which was five, okay, so five, no, 572 Linkley's and 588 Linkley's, which is a very large house, which is 35 feet back from the lane, and I, I would challenge anyone to look at that and say, that that building hasn't been there for a long time because the applicant, without mentioning names, made a pledge that you wouldn't notice any difference in the lane when it was finished. That's true. And I guarantee now that you look at it and you say, whoa, that vegetation couldn't have been stripped all the way and put back, but it can. So I think that's one of your challenges. Secondly, I, I would ask you to look at the zoning because this is where you're going to run into some problems. Because you are right mid-block of an RS2. And one of the things you have to look at in Oak Bay is where, way before me, way before all you guys, there was RS2 zoning. And what were the values of the community that they put, they put into that? We've always had problems with this recording system. <laughs> What was, the, what was the issues that Oak Bay dealt with when they put those RS2 zonings? And you'll notice there are very few RS2 zonings. So you've got a couple of issues here, not insurmountable, but what you have to do is come up with a policy of how you're going to deal with um, heritage revitalization agreements, which I think are fantastic, but at the same time protecting, because this is not a house on a alley or a lane between Hampshire and Monterey on the back lane there. This is a, a country lane that is all part of the Anderson Hill, Linkley's, Island Road, and transit. You're going to get these applications on transit as well. So what you're dealing with tonight requires you to think about the policy and what you're going to do and how you're going to deal with it. That's all I wanted to say, and I wish you luck. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Costin. Uh, anybody else wish to come forward and speak to council? So that's the third and final time. Not seeing anybody else, so thank you very much. Uh, we are now moving to the close of the public hearing. I believe we need to have a... Uh, Move adjournment. Second. Oh, actually, before we have the adjournment, I think I just need to have a couple of closing remarks. Uh, the public hearing is now closed officially for our uh, for public input. Uh, now that it's closed, we can't take any more submissions or comments from the public on. Uh, um, so any any interested persons uh, can't uh, contact us with more information. Um, please be advised that should council need clarification or staff opinion on issues raised at this public hearing, or the information associated with the public hearing. 
Council can request such clarification from staff after the close of the public hearing at the following regular meeting of Council when third reading of the proposed bylaw is being considered. And um, that looks like that will be next week if all is going to plan. Uh, it should also be noted that as per the Local Government Act after a public hearing, Council may without further notice or hearing adopt or defeat the proposed bylaw or alter and then adopt the bylaw so long as it does not affect the user density. I'm sure that's just a requirement statement on there. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there we go. We're not going to have a, uh, do any other changes with another public hearing, so it's just a, a formality. Uh, with that, we need a motion. We have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Seconded. All, Second. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed. Thank you very much. I'm going to just take five minutes, and we'll, we'll reconvene at 8:20 uh, for our scheduled uh, council meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out for this. a couple of people who say things but I'm like I'm not entirely sure what you're saying. are they in favor <laughs> are they espousing a value in it yeah well now we just got six hours of counsel and two hours in camera and we'll be done <laughs> uh, right yep get some muffins
All right, if I could just ask everybody to take their seats, we'll start in about 30 seconds. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for your patience. If you're expecting a 7 o'clock start time for this uh, meeting, uh, here we are at 8.23 to call this meeting to order. Uh, we do start this meeting as we do all our meetings, with uh, just acknowledging that we are holding this meeting uh, on the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish peoples, uh, specifically the Lekongan-speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and we respect the fact that their connections to these lands continue to this day. I also want to point out that these uh, meetings are video live streamed and recorded for archive purposes. So if you do come to the microphone and speak on anything, uh, those will be included in the video uh, broadcast. Um, I need to have a motion just to amend the agenda slightly. Uh, obviously with the, the deferral of uh, 602 Newport, we're just the, the agenda will remove items 11, 12 and 13, which are the items related to 602 Newport. And I would like to move the item number 13 reconsideration motion of 2506-2512 Wooten uh, to uh, the point immediately following the minutes and preceding the public input portion. I'll make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, none opposed? Turning myself off, that's never a good sign. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just going to, we because all of this moving around and changing, I'm just going to make sure I'm in the right point in my notes uh, to get things correct. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, uh, we're now on item 13, which is the reconsideration motion. And this just, uh, it's a prerogative of a mayor to bring back, sorry, this is item 14 on the, on the agenda. Um, uh, of a mayor to bring back a, uh, an item that was previously debated and voted on for, uh, for reconsideration. And so that's what this item is. This is related to the duplex on Wooten. Um, uh, it has been the, the tradition of this body to have all members present for uh, significant land use decisions. And so we're, we're having this one back to, our, uh, to this discussion uh, so that uh, Councillor Braithwaite can be here as part of the, dis as part of the debate. Uh, and it essentially just reopens the debate at the point that we left it off last time. Uh, for those who are curious about where we're at in this process. Um, and I just want to confirm with Councillor Braithwaite. Councillor Braithwaite, did you have a chance to read the minutes of the public hearing prior to this? I read the minutes and watched the video twice. Oh, there you go. I was a keener. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so that uh, reopens the, the, the discussion here. We have had um, some, <coughs> excuse me, some debate on this uh, on this issue already. So, uh, Councillor Braithwaite, I would just uh, perhaps bring it to you if you have anything you wish to add to the debate. And actually, before you, actually before you do that, I'm just going to turn to staff. Is there any sort of protocol here? Is should I should I uh, bring? Any, I'm not bringing this back because I disagree with the decision. I'm bringing it back so that there's a a chance for all, all councillors to be heard and have a vote on this item. So, is there anything that I should be covering off at this point in this process? My first ever reconsideration, and hopefully the last I ever have to do. So, uh, Your Worship, as you've provided rationale, and if no new information has been received, uh, you should just treat the item like first and second has been uh, given to the bylaw, which it has, and now you can enter into debate, and then the vote is called. Okay, thank you. And I just, uh, I know there was some um, question uh, raised uh, in terms of what that means about no new information being risen. So, I just want to make sure I'm clear that uh, we've had a public hearing on this, and so this is now in the reconsideration. Is, is, uh, have we had a, a clarification in terms of what our, whether we should go back to public hearing or just have this meeting as it is? My understanding is we're okay just bringing the debate back following the public hearing. Thank you, Your Worship. So if no new correspondence or a delegation has been received by the body of council, um, then that is what triggers, is it new information or not new information? Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. No new information specifically related to this application. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Braithwaite? Uh, you want me to state my opinion now, or is that... I guess I should, before I do that, is there, I guess I should ask the question, has the body of council received new information that, that we have here that would, that would trigger a uh, new public hearing? That's another question. 
Councillor Zoltan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have done uh, research um, on my own in terms of uh, trying to um, uh, flesh out some of the information I received from staff uh, in looking up uh, uh, Nanaimo bylaws. I did share uh, my research with, with, uh, with Council, so you have a flavor for what I was able to find. I also did some research as to um, the uh, efficacy, the, the legality of moving forward with, a, with a, a, a reconsideration motion, and I tend to concur with staff um, that, uh, that it is a reasonable thing to proceed. I do apologize. A, a question related, though, to, to procedure, if I may. I, I thought we were doing this after the public hearing and we, after we received the minutes. You want to do this as the first item before the minutes? I wasn't oh, sure you're on good the point. order. I asked this for, you're right. I'm doing a very poor job of, of chairing this. Um, now that I've called a reconsideration on this, where am I at here and procedure wise? Do it now? Okay. We'll just continue with this and we'll do the minutes afterwards. Thank you for catching me out on that, though. I appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just so excited about this piece of the thing. Uh, all right, it's been a long night already, apparently. The, um, so, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. And again, my apologies for not um, being able to be present at the original public hearing uh, and to be, to be around the table to make the decision. Um, as I've mentioned, I have uh, read the minutes and watched the video twice. Um, and so here's my, some of my thoughts um, around this. Um, and that would be that um, the OCP, uh, Established Neighborhoods Land Use Designation, does speak, I believe, to diversifying housing options while retaining qualities that make neighborhoods attractive. I do believe that the proposal would allow for an improvement to the existing building without substantially affecting the neighborhood. So you have to really keep in mind that this duplex has been here in this location since before even I was born, so like 30 years. Um, okay, maybe 40 or 50, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, I would agree that with the staff report uh, that says the proposal contributes to and satisfies several OCP housing objectives and policies by retraining uh, a form that contributes to diverse housing options without disrupting existing trees, parking, traffic, or other neighborhood characteristics. So I'm happy to be able to um, now sit around this table and, and I will be voting in favor for this, um, this reconsideration. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. But I, before we get to too strong a statements on support, I, there was a couple of uh, concerns raised last time, and I just would like to give the opportunity, since we're here now, to for anybody who has concerns about this, to be possibly raise them. Or if there's any again questions or clarifications of staff at this time, I'm happy to take those as well. Okay, <laughs> okay Councillor Green. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to clarify because I, I understand at the time that I wasn't perhaps as clear as I could have been about my concerns about the proposal. And so I just want to reiterate those and I will state them as follows. Um, the compelling new information in correspondence from the adjacent neighbor about the impacts on them of this project. A submission from an Oak Bay resident about potential legal or policy implications of this particular rezoning going ahead. Comments from colleagues who had similar concerns, comments by the applicants to local media, and a consideration that included the fact that Council has not yet completed its housing needs study and housing plan. And while I do agree in principle with duplexes, I would like to see all of the non-conforming duplexes um, have their zoning changed in the future. So I would like to see them treated as a collective body rather than as a case by case. So those are my reasons and that's why I did not support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Anybody else wish to speak? Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, a question uh, through you to staff, if I may take this opportunity. Um, I, I would love to um, uh, understand a bit more of some of the information I received at, um, at the last uh, meeting. Uh, although the Director of Building and Planning isn't here, I'm sure I'm sure uh, Ms. Jensen will be able to, to, to fill his, uh, his shoes um, uh, or whomever is appropriate. I did want to ask in particular, um, why have so many other um, districts uh, throughout British Columbia um, uh, put in their zoning bylaws, put in their, their various bylaws, uh, such controls over duplexes with respect to strata? Why is strata of a duplex, um, uh, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't know whether it's fearful or whether there's something else going on, but um, there, there appears to be something going on with respect to the stratification of these um, multi-family properties that, um, uh, from from first blush, seems to have a severe impact on the rental stock 
available in the district. So I would love to have uh, the opinion, the information from our, our staff to, to help understand why um, so many controls need to be put in with respect specifically to strata on the, uh, on the duplexing aspect, please. Okay, uh, we why is always a bit of a tricky one for staff to answer since their their council uh, bylaws approved. But I will miss. I'm looking back and for Ms. Varela. It's late went on. I'll give it to her. Ms. Thank Varela. you, Your Worship. Um, so different um, local governments will take different approaches. Uh, it was interesting at the most recent planning conference. They were talking about trends about. Uh, housing forms and stratification and things like that. So I'm leery to make general statements about past trends and current trends in this context, um, but we certainly could bring back information in a general uh, context as part of the housing discussion moving forward. But again, um, looking at different zoning bylaws in different local governments is uh, very different, um, and it's very difficult, and, and you certainly... Um, to speak to rationales is also unfair because each of those community plans are going to be different as well. So uh, again, it's a, a unique made in Oak Bay situation uh, that you want to focus on, not the trends across the province in this context, uh, respectfully. Thank you, Ms. Brella. If I may? Yes. Thank Go you ahead. very much. Uh, so continuing with the general questioning, um, so I understand the concern around generalizations. Uh, I did ask specifically uh, uh, in the last meeting about Nanaimo because uh, in Nanaimo, uh, and hopefully we have some experience of people who maybe even worked in Nanaimo at one point, who may be able to uh, uh, help understand why Nanaimo has a very extensive and well-written, I must say, policy on strata conversion policies and guidelines that maybe we could learn from as a single example. Um, uh, I do notice that also within the uh, zoning bylaws of Nanaimo, for certain of their actual uh, zoning um, um, uh, 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 zones, uh, they have um, uh, specific restrictions on subdivisions or otherwise strata tiled uh, titled um, uh, where they they do not allow in certain some of their zones uh, uh, any kind of stratification um, of a, uh, a, a dual or multi uh, lot type um, subdivisions. So I was wondering if maybe from a single uh, specific uh, whether that possibly could be um, uh, some some learnings with respect to Nanaimo that we could learn from Oak Bay. Oak Bay, of course, is very small. We have only so much staff, only so much resources, and one of the things that I think that has helped to keep us so pristine, so wonderful, so um, uh, such paradise is that uh, we have been able to learn from the mistakes of others. So not wanting to generalize, so let's get specific. Why does Nanaimo have such strong controls on the stratification aspects of duplexes in particular, please? I might again take that away from the why, because I think it's just difficult, but I will ask the, I'll allow the question to you. Is it Ms. Jensen is best to answer this one? There are some zones in Nanaimo which have this restriction, so perhaps you could address where those fit. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mary. You're testing my memory. <laughs> oh, going back to writing those documents. So there's actually a couple of different provisions in Nanaimo documents that speak to strata conversion. Um, the first of those actually goes back to the official community plan, which was adopted before the new zoning bylaw. And as part of that document, there are uh, policies in there that speak more to the vacancy threshold of, of strata conversion for multifamily buildings. And even that that doesn't necessarily take it down all the way to a, um, a, a duplex unit, but rather, uh, I believe hmm, I believe the last percentage rate was 3%. Don't hold me to that, but I think it was 3% um, looking at the vacancy rate in terms um, of council considering a strata conversion. With respect to the zoning bylaw, there is a clause in the zoning bylaw for the um, AR zones, which is more the rural agricultural areas. Uh, for those pieces, it serves kind of a multi-purpose. A lot of those areas are subject to the Agricultural Land Reserve, which would have to go through a process anyway to allow for subdivision. Uh, the other piece of it is that something in an MO called the Urban Reserve, where they were looking more for um, a broader plan for the very residential areas and before allowing any further um, conversion to happen in those areas. Uh, again, the clause that's in the zoning bylaw, I, I'm going to refer to it more as a flag. It actually would not hold up in terms of a zoning regulation. So if 
uh, in fact, uh, an applicant came in in one of those zones to the approving officer to council, it would still have to be considered that that regulation and zoning bylaw would not be enough. Anything else? Yes, if I could get even more specific and ask in a general <laughs> sense, uh, sorry, not, not in, in a more specific sense, and, and I'll have to be delicate with this question because I was hoping to ask the Director of Building and Planning and not the person so designated as the Approving Officer because it's a question about how the Approving Officer may make decisions. So this will, uh, you, maybe you could help me with the wording if I word it <laughs> indelicately. Uh, so the question that I would have to ask then is with respect to the one duplex that we had moved forward here in Oak Bay that I think was uh, designated in, 20, in 2014, and then in 2017 it went through a process where it was stratified, I understand, and it did not come to council, and yet I understood it was occupied. I'm not sure whether it was rented or not, but it was occupied. So the question I wanted to ask is, as in the context of Oak Bay, uh, what considerations would the approving officer take with respect to the stratification of a duplex going forward? And I need to know this to help me understand how to vote on this um, question. Thank you. I think that's a fair question. I might reframe that slightly and may see if I get this right, because uh, I'm curious about this as well. I'm not 100% clear where the approving officer would approve a strata or have the responsibility for that versus when it would come to council. So is it a strata conversion, what, what, a rental conversion? Where, where does that, in our, in our processes, where does that trigger come to council versus to staff? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. In its simplest, if you are building a new multifamily building, whether that is a duplex or 10 units, if you have the correct zoning in place, which presumably you do since you were building it, uh, that goes through the land title authority. It has nothing to do with the approving officer. It has nothing to do with council. If you have an existing building, such as one that was constructed in 1930, 1950, 2000, if they are looking for a strata conversion of those existing units, in Oak Bay, that would come to this council for consideration. They would be the approving authority. They would consider those applications in respect of the Strata Property Act. There are some very specific references that are listed in there that would have to be considered by council. So it, if any existing duplex that's a rental unit gets converted to Strata or wants to be converted to Strata, it would come to council? Is that, is that the current pr process? Essentially, yes. Yeah, in, for either of those situations, the designated approving officer plays no role in that other than to bring the report forward to council. Thank you. Does that clarify? It does, but I do have one more question. Go ahead. One more question. <laughs> Just one little question. Just one more little question. If I may, please, the, through you to staff. Um, um, how could a patient um, landowner who currently has a duplex with rentals, convert it to a, an empty duplex that doesn't have rentals so that possibly they could move forward and then do the, do the stratification without the, the input of council. The reason I ask this is that at one point in the uh, legislation, it's specific, I, think, I think the number was, it was 18 months. The, the property had to be vacant for 18 months, and at that point, it's no longer a rental. It's essentially a, treated like an empty building. But I couldn't find that 18 months anymore, so I don't know what the current guideline is in terms of how long you need to keep a building vacant to lose the rental aspect, and it's now no longer something that has to come to council. So I just wanted to, to know if... Uh, or, or, or what that m might be and how the approving officer in Oak Bay might handle a situation like that. Please. I'll turn it to Ms. Jensen. I'm, I, this is the question of whether that can be done probably first, and if so, what would be the, is, are, there, are there protections in place to prevent that from happening? I'm not sure if I'm going to specifically hit what Councillor Zelka's question is. There is... Uh, to the effect of a strata conversion, I'm not aware of any legislation around that. Uh, there is a clause for non-conforming units where you lose your non-conforming status after a six months use, but that's specific to a use. It may not apply to a building where you already have two units existing.
but I guess for, for clarification, should anybody at any point take an existing duplex and want to make major changes to it or, or to turn it into a stratification, even if it's sat empty for some time, it's zoned as a single family zone currently, non-conforming duplex. So it would trigger that uh, the stratification process to come to council, is that correct? I would expect so, but again, you'd have to look at the individual case. Okay, thank you. The last point, if I may? Yes. Uh, the, the reason I bring this point up is that, you know, today in Oak Bay, we have approximately 300 empty houses that are being maintained and being left empty, approximately, uh, by, by, by the best estimates that, that, that we can come by. Um, so it's not, uh, while it seems crazy, uh, it just seems to be true. Uh, other districts, uh, other cities have even higher numbers, and I don't quite understand why they're doing that, but they are. So I just wanted to, to make sure that, uh, that this council, this, this body, always had some measure of control over what we'd like to see moving forward with respect to protecting, in particular, protecting our rental stock. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll just should just ask your opinion since we're getting. Oh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and just as a follow up to this, this was one of my concerns in considering the application. Um, as has been stated at other meetings, we uh, Oak Bay does have one other new duplex, the first in many years, um, and I think that. Uh, all of the members of council and certainly most of the community thought that that was a positive step forward for the community. But since development and since Strata uh, uh, was used on the unit, the unit has sat vacant. And so the, the well-intentioned desire to bring diversity to the community actually didn't result in, in those positive benefits that we saw. And I certainly am hopeful that as we move forward in developing um, a housing plan that we will um, perhaps look at what our other communities are, are doing so that as we consider these um, changes in the community uh, moving forward that we actually can achieve positive benefits to the community because to have the, du the one duplex in many years developed and having it sitting vacant um, was not the purpose that was intended. Thank you. Thank you. I know that one half of it's lived in. I'm, apparently the second half is not. Um, again, I'm, I take it back to this specific application. If there's con Are there concerns raised on this application that, that the the approval of changes to this or legalizing this duplex would, would result in that being more vacant? Is that the is that the concern still existing after the answers from council or from staff? Are you asking a question? Yeah, just, I'm just curious. Just, uh, yeah. Well, for, for me, the, the, the one of the concerns that I have is that uh, right now, there, uh, there, if I remember correctly, there were, there were three families living in that building. And uh, at, at the very least, we're going to be losing one of them as a result of this, uh, this, uh, this duplex going forward, and that concerns me. Um, uh, so, um, at the appropriate time, I'd like to move an amendment uh, to the motion being brought forward. Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether we're still in discussion or whether we're moving into um, something a bit further. We're sitting at third reading right now. I'm not sure. We have to be very careful about amending third reading just because there's a, there's a process attached to the bylaw. So, I think it depends a little bit on what the amendment is in terms of what that process would be. You can make an amendment at any time. Then I'll make the amendment now, if I may. Um, and, uh, and if this results in, in a change that requires a, a public hearing again, well, so be it. But I think this, this change is something that, that, uh, that I hopefully, well, let's, let's, let's see what you think. Um, whereas the essence of this bylaw, uh, 3531.104, is simply to rezone the named, pr named property to RD1 in order to remove the legal non-conforming status of the duplex and to allow a second story addition. That's its only purpose. And whereas the Stratic Act came, but that when the Stratic Act came in, Oak Bay immediately removed duplex zoning to control the wholesale removal of rentals as had occurred elsewhere. And whereas Oak Bay, maybe due to its small size, or maybe the fact that we are so, such awake, aware, and nimble counselors that we, have, we learn well from the mistakes of others uh, that have helped to create this paradise that we have here. 
And whereas in 2014, in the last meeting of an outgoing council, bylaw, the bylaw bringing in RD1 duplex zoning was rushed back into existence, but without clear strata protection for rentals. And whereas protection of the rental stock is of utmost importance, and I think even more so in recent times. And whereas we can take the same approach here as we did for cannabis regulation, which is to do a blanket outlaw, which, uh, a blanket outlaw, um, which uh, in a non-intuitive way ensures that any proposal that could still come forward would be guaranteed to come to council for decision. And finally, whereas, if we do not provide clear direction or policy for the approving officer, if this body does not do that, an owner of this or other duplexes achieving RD1 rezoning could, with enough patience, bypass council and have the approving officer act alone on a strata titling subdivision, as had occurred on the Estevan property in 2017. Therefore, be it resolved to amend this rezoning bylaw to add this wording to the zoning bylaw 1986, and that would be under section 6.6 RD1 zone. Insert the line, section 6.6.1 subsection 3, and I'll be fine to email this to staff uh, if as necessary. Uh, and under this new section 6613, strata plans are not allowed under this zoning category, the category of RD1, um, or some such other wording as affected by staff to achieve the same. Uh, I don't know that we can have that, that, well, let's see if there's a seconder and I'll check for if there's a, if there's interest from the. I'll second it just to get the discussion on the table. Okay, then I will go to staff and just ask the question. I think this would substantially change the application that we we couldn't consider this as part of this application process other than to go back. Uh, Your Worship, staff would require clarification. It, I'm not sure, but it sounds like we're talking about a zoning bylaw amendment, uh, blanket zoning bylaw amendment, which is a separate and aside from this particular uh, decision-making point for council so staff would just need clarification please okay fair enough it does in fact sound like what this is it adds a broader zoning change requirement uh, so to, to, to clarify if I may uh, before since it is uh, been seconded the essence is that um, uh, this um, this uh, motion on the floor uh, uh, the, that the amendment is, is attempting to change is the actual um, um, let's see if I bring it up here um, where is it here? Uh, so uh, we're making changes to the zoning bylaw as a result of this of this uh, public hearing process and uh, the third hearing, uh, the third reading, which is to modify the zoning bylaw. So I just simply wanted to add an extra line on the modification to the zoning bylaw. Um, I don't wish to undercut the intent of the process, which is to make the duplex le legal. However, there's nothing in the process here that talks about allowing strata going forward. So I don't see how this actually changes the intent of the motion. The intent of the motion is fundamentally to make the duplex legal uh, by rezoning it. I'd like to continue to do that, but at the same time, in the future, to make sure that there's no uh, process going forward and that we continue to have the um, rentals uh, of Oak Bay protected, uh, this would actually provide direction to the approving officer and it would ensure that if someone in the future did want to stratify a duplex, they would just simply have to come back to council. It wouldn't stop it. Uh, I, th I believe that, I hear what you're saying, it is a change to the zoning bylaw, but I'm gonna turn to staff here that this is really adding this property to RD1, not, not changing the, the whole course of the bylaw itself. So I will just, I'll give staff a chance to consider this as part of the piece and if I may, I've, I've emailed it to, uh, to um, our CAO and our Director of Corporate Services. Thank you, Your Worship. So the motion that's on the floor uh, is that the bylaw be read a third time. Um, so again, to me, this seems like a separate and aside 
uh, motion. However, if council should uh, choose to direct staff to do uh, further research uh, after this application is considered, it seems to me there's an 18 month window of concern uh, that I'm not sure is actually applicable given uh, Oak Bay's um, uh, bylaws. So again, to me, I'm still hearing them as two separate uh, considerations. I would tend to agree with that. I think this is this motion by its in, the, in and of its nature is changing the, the core of the of the bylaw more than the specifics of the third reading of this particular bylaw. Um, I am the motion's been made. I, I don't think I can. I'm just just a second. I have to decide if this is going to be if I rule this out of order or if I let the question go to the council. Can I ask the or some direction from staff here in terms of the? I am concerned here that it does fundamentally change the nature of the of the motion on the floor, which is just third reading of the bylaw. Uh, I believe your worship, and I'll welcome any of those sitting at the <laughs> table beside me to, to weigh in. But I, it seems you have two separate motions on the floor, both of which have been first and seconded. We have a motion to amend on the floor. Yeah. We have first one's motion. live, the second one is first and second. Thank yeah. you. Worded that wrong. Yeah. Uh, we do have a motion. I just have to decide whether it's I'm going to rule it in order or not. I. My point of procedure, if I may, or go point, ahead. Uh, point of information in particular. Um, so a question with respect to public hearings. Um, when the public has a chance to speak, and they provide information, and then we have we have, can chat, ask questions of staff, and we can get clarifications. Can we not make changes to the motion at any point in the process? I, 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 and I don't. And if we can't, then I don't quite understand what our purpose is up here. I thought our process was to receive the new information, and and, and in terms of our. Um, uh, public engagement aspect, this is the only time the public has a chance to provide input with respect to these motions. So with respect to what I heard the staff and the public saying, this is where this this modification amendment is coming from. Yeah, no, it's it's a fair uh, comment, uh, Councillor Zalka. I, I'm, there's a procedural issue here in terms of uh, you can allow amendments up to a certain amount. Uh, I believe if this amendment were to pass, it would be it's it's substantially more. It's actually asking to change the entirety of the zoning bylaw to include a clause on on strata, you know, banning all stratas within that zoning bylaw, which doesn't currently exist. That's a significant shift from what we're considering here, which is do we allow this particular property to be included within that zone? So I'm just trying to get my head around: does this qualify as a as a amendment, or is this really a substantively different motion than is being considered here? And my inclination here is to think it's actually it's not that you can't make amendments; it's just whether or not this amendment is within that that purview of the of the piece. And I'll just and in the wording of the motion, I included um, or such wording as staff may suggest or effect to achieve the same. So I understand that the wording or the way it's been worded may not be correct, but I did finish it off with, or such wording is affected by staff to achieve the same. If that means it gets broken into two separate motions, I'm fine with that. But essentially the essence is to ensure that we don't lose our rental stock to the use of this zoning. That our, our um, um, it's, it's fair. I think I'm, my ruling on this one, and I'll, I'll, it, this is my, my inclination here, and I'll turn to staff to see if there's any at, at peace. From a procedural perspective, I think this motion is not uh, an amendment to the motion. This is an amendment to the zoning bylaw and would have to be separated. I believe a change like that to the zoning bylaw would have to be raised as through a notice of motion process to change the very nature of the, of the zoning bylaw included. So I don't think I can allow that amendment to this particular motion. However, I am heartened by the fact that the staff said we there's even if that 18 month window is in fact a thing, we have lots of time to bring that motion forward to council, and you're welcome to do so. And think I don't think I can allow that amendment at this table tonight. If I may, yeah, absolutely. At the pleasure of council, I'm fine to convert that amendment to a notice of motion at the appropriate time. Sure, that would be done on a new business. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, so. Uh, that that uh, motion to amend is now off the table, um, and uh, we're back to the main motion now, which is third reading. Any other? Oh, and then I will call the question. I, I oh. guess I, I'm just going to make some final comments. Oh, I made some previously, Mr. Mayor. But um, 
you know the the, the most the, the the issue on the table is really whether to rezone duplex, and um, I, you know it, my, I, I'm going to vote in favor of this. But uh, my reason for doing that is it's uh, fully consistent with uh, what we're aiming to do according to our OCP. But my my big concern is. Um, it, it's not actually about rental, though rental is an important housing strategy from my perspective, but not, not here, because we have already, as a council, decided that we're going to increase our rental stock with our secondary suite program. And there, we have the potential to increase rental housing stock by, by thousands, actually. But we have not talked about using our, the few non-conforming duplex zoning for rental stock. And the issue for me is by starting to get focused on preserving rental stock by some of the strategies that have been suggested, is that we're taking away an important form of housing option that we need for the missing middle. And there aren't many places where we can do that. And we have these 50 or 60 non-conforming duplexes. And maybe at a certain point, we will be able to do this more collectively with all of them. But if this one is not preserved right now and moved over to duplexing, it's possible. We, none of us knows for sure. But this property then becomes at risk for being taken down and then one very large single family home could be constructed. And we've seen that happening throughout the community where these larger lots, where there's non-conforming duplexes are taken down and very large five, six, 7,000 square foot homes are put in. From what I've understood, when we went through the OCP, that is not the form of housing stock that we need in our established neighborhoods. We said we want a, 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 a diverse range of housing options. And the, this kind of housing that's offered to us with the duplex zoning is a rare commodity, but one that would fulfill um, families coming into the community and also permit um, families or, or to, to age out in the community because they're somewhat slow, uh, smaller and they tend to be somewhat less expensive, whatever that means in, in, in Oak Bay, but not as expensive as other forms. So I, I will be voting in favor of the uh, motion. Thank you, Councilor Nay. I just want to clarify that there's no, we don't know exactly what the regulations are going to be on secondary suites at this point, but they are one of the, uh, the housing options being considered as part of our housing framework, along with duplexes for that matter. Uh, any other comments before we get to the question? Uh, Councilor Zelka? Uh, point of information, I was fascinated to find out that in Nanaimo, uh, for duplexes with uh, two living units, they outlaw secondary suites. Very interesting. And um, so um, I, 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 I hear the, um, the, the suggestions from, um, from my colleagues. Um, I'm just concerned on, on this property then until we have uh, strata controls in place that uh, uh, what happened on Estevan will just continue to happen on the other RD ones. And I'm, I'm, or would potentially will become already one. So I'm worried that we're going to just um, lose our, our rental housing. So until those controls are in place, I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Any other comments? I'm, I will say I'm comforted by the comments by staff, and I, I also feel that that debate about stratification on stratification is an important one as part of our housing uh, framework discussion. But I think uh, in the, this case where we're looking to preserve a single duplex and, and make it legal and, and allow it to be uh, improved upon, I feel comfortable with the, with the protections that are in place, especially as we consider those other options. So, Sending other comments, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Three opposed, Councillor Zelka, Councillor Patterson, and Councillor Green. Uh, I'm voting in favor of this application, so on reconsideration it passes. Thank you very much. That was item number 14. Uh, so just wrap your head around back and forth. I'm going to go back to item number one now, which is minutes. And uh, are there any uh, changes or corrections to the minutes? Councillor uh, Braithwaite. Um, yes, uh, for the public hearing minutes held on June 24th, it actually shows me as being present when I wasn't, and I actually didn't arrive until the new business section in the actual council meeting. So I think we perhaps we need to change that, but thank you. Thank you. And I will point out, and I do appreciate, for those of you who didn't notice, uh, we've changed the formatting of our, of our agendas 
uh, this time around. Uh, with the public hearing is now very distinct from the, uh, from the council uh, and an effort made to sort of separate the more formalized public hearing process from the council process because these have been uh, uh, corrections that we've had to make a few times uh, over the years. So with that correction, any other questions, errors, omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None opposed, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor's remarks. Uh, uh, your Worship. Oh, sorry. Archie, move receipt of the minutes. <laughs> move, to. move. Move approval of the amend of the minutes. Uh, the amended minutes of the minute of the m public hearing held June twenty fourth, twenty nineteen. Moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Uh, your Worship. Yes. Uh, that bylaw that you just gave third reading to was also on the floor for adoption at the last meeting. If you wanted to oh, uh, so address that, so we need to move adoption now. as well. Okay, yes, sorry, my you. apologies. So we have third reading. Mm, move adoption. Move adoption. Second. Move and seconded. Any further? Well, no discussion of, on adoption. All those in favor? Oh, uh, sorry, we're back just to the uh, the Wooten duplex. Yeah, uh, we did third reading. My I'm used to doing third reading and adoption. My apologies. So this is adoption. Um. I, audiences can't call point of order. Many members of council can call a point of order. Um, I'm going to. <laughs> Is it not supposed to be a day between uh, third reading and? No. I don't want to ask. Thank you. No, there's not. So sorry. My my apologies for skipping that that stage. Uh, we're back to f uh, adoption on uh, the Wooten Bylaw 3531.104. All clear. Uh, so we have mover and seconder. All those in favor? Opposed. Councillor Green, Councillor Patterson, Councillor Zalka opposed. Uh, the adoption passes. Thank you. Um, my remarks will be mercifully short given the hour. Uh, I just <laughs> want to thank uh, uh, a couple of things. One, I just want to congratulate uh, Ms. Hopkins, Deb Hopkins, who is uh, taking over the role of Director of Corporate Services with the Municipality of Oak Bay. She's been with us uh, for a number of years and has done a phenomenal job in the role of assist as the Deputy Director and uh, really has brought a lot of strength to that role and we're looking forward to some some continued improvements to all of our things. So we'll just see how a little round of applause for. We just like to embarrass people at this at these meetings. So thank you, Ms. Hopkins, and, and congratulations on that. And I'd also like to take a moment to also embarrass, I mean, thank uh, Mr. Jones, Warren Jones, who is our, direct, actually our current director of corporate services and is retiring in very short time frame here. And so his last meeting. So um, Mr. Jones has been with us for a number of uh, a number of years and has really uh, raise the uh, level of uh, both professionalism and knowledge base uh, from his vast experience in, in civic governance over the years. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank you on behalf of Council for all your years of service here and the great work that you've done and you're going to be missed. Although we're happy to have Deb there, but it's uh, you're definitely going to be missed. So thank you very much. Oh, you're making me stand up. Damn it. <laughs> all right, thank you. We're on to item number three now, which is the public participation period. Uh, as a chance for anybody from the audience to speak to any item of interest uh, to Oak Bay. Uh, just come forward to the microphone, which I will turn on. And the rules of uh, order here, just you can just state your name and your municipality of residence. If you can write down your name as well so we have the correct spelling. Uh, each speaker. Graham yeah. Ross, Oak Bay. Um, <clears throat> it's come to my attention that <laughs> that council has retained a consultant to uh, review the uh, commissions and committees and how they are established, uh, whether they're working well and so forth. Uh, but it's also, I believe, only the members of the various committees and commissions are being asked for their input. Now, I have I spent time in North Saanich on both the Advisory Planning Commission and the Parks Commission at different times, and uh, I have no uh, intention of applying to get on any commission at this point. I'm over the hill, but I feel that there may be other people in the community, such as myself, who may be able to offer suggestions when it comes to the formation of commissions and committees. And therefore, uh, I would like to recommend that council uh, somehow 
provide for a public hearing, meeting, uh, town hall, whatever you want to call it, to elicit from the general public their input into the makeup of commissions and committees. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross, for that suggestion. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward to speak to council? Please do. And again, the process is you have up to three minutes. To, and again, to speak your name and municipality of residence. Um, my name is Howard Johnson. I'm a resident of Old Gate. And uh, what I want to uh, address is item number five, the proposal to erect a Seelor sculpture in front of 1450 Beach Drive, um, in front of my place. <laughs> um, I already wrote a letter, and I'm not going to go into my, the, the, repeat that stuff. But what I want to do is I'd like to, um, well, my question is this, um, really, is this or any other installation appropriate for the Oak Bay we Beach Drive waterfront? And the reason I'm asking this is, is sometimes I don't think we fully appreciate what we already have. And um, that section there, that's just not a any old waterfront. That is, that's a unique and spectacular location. And if you were to live down there or spend some time there, you'd see that that section. It's a beautiful panorama. And it, the water, or the water changes day by day. The, um, the shoreline, it varies all over the place, and it changes as the tide goes up and down. And uh, we got Mary Todd Island over there, beautiful colors and shapes. And looking far over, we see the San Juan Island Mountains. Um, and, and one of the most spectacular things is the cloud formations. They change up by hour, and they're just wonderful. Um, and then the boats, well, maybe some of them not so, not so great, but, you know, they sit there, and they're very, they're, they add to it, and, um, and, our, and our wildlife. And so... Without a doubt, I think, that's just a world-class view. So what I'm thinking is, why would one want to add an, an object in that, in that view, in that panorama, that would um, distract from what we have now, the natural, the, all the Oak Bay? I mean, that's our treasure, Oak Bay, right? Um, so, I, I, I would, I was, I don't know whether I should add this little thing, but I will. I think it's a little bit like making a slight modification to the Mona Lisa. Say we uh, take and add a diamond necklace to her. Um, the object would be beautiful, but the portrait would be diminished. And that's what I believe will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'll just come forward if you have any interest. There's a couple more people coming forward to speak. You can just stand in behind, and that's probably the simplest. Good evening, again. Good evening. Um, I'm Carol Ann Moore. I live in Oak Bay. And same topic. Unfortunately, I'm going to read it this time because I got kerfluffled last time. I wrote to you during the last round of discussions on this subject and <clears throat> have written more recently. My objections remain unchanged. The idea of setting a precedent is one of the main concerns. Should you, <clears throat> should, me, should you allow one person to erect a statue or artwork within the municipal boundaries, you then must grant the same permission to everyone who wants to take, <clears throat> pardon me, who wants some token of their existence placed on public display. What happens if five 
or 10 requests come in in a year? How do you say no to one when you've said one yes to another one? What are the parameters and who will set them, especially should you receive multiple requests in a single year? What types of donations are going to be accepted? Currently, it's money. If someone already owns a piece of art and they want to donate it, can they just choose it, put it wherever they want? Do you have to accept it? Who decides where it's going to be put? Can the donor choose a spot? And how much clutter in the name of art can we be expected to have? I do hope these topics will be considered for your deliberations. And I have a copy here, which I will leave of my last issues. No thank you. Just yeah. Thank you for writing your name down. The next speaker would come forward. Um. Hi, my name's Nancy Barnes, and I've already written a couple of letters on this, so I know you framed them and committed them to memory, so I won't repeat them, but I did want to emphasize um, a couple other points pertaining to the sea lore sculpture issue, um, and one of them is the process by which this, as, as has just been mentioned, by which this whole issue has come about. Um, it concerns me greatly that without any meaningful public consultation, one person's whim by virtue of a donation, can arbitrarily impose a landmark of their own choosing on our community. That I find that extremely concerning. And the other concern, and I don't know if it's true, but um, I've heard that someone's planning to write a, a book and publish it pertaining to this thing, and uh, this would be taking advantage of a public space to promote a personal project, which is completely unacceptable. So I'm hoping... Um, the community should not be obligated to accept one person's personal choice of both statue and placement. And I hope Council won't allow that our natural seascape to be impinged upon by this statue. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Vicki Vicky Turner. Uh, I just want to heartily agree with the remarks of the previous speaker. Um, I don't even, personally, I don't even think it's a great piece of art, let alone, uh, you know, just visually. I think it's very kitschy looking. I wrote a letter over the week, you know, I wrote an email over the weekend. I think it's a very kitschy statue and would probably look all right in a, maybe in, maybe in a children's park somewhere or at Disney World, and I'm quite serious about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. My name is Sharman Minus, and you've had a lot of letters from me from a few months ago and one that I wrote in recently. Um, I've been thinking quite hard about this. Um, I also, because you were, um, you had that um, public hearing just just now, you probably didn't get a chance to look at the emails that were sent in, the correspondence that was attached to this uh, statue um, motion. Um, I counted them up. Fifty-five people were against, and six were for. Just to let you know the numbers, and I worked out the percentage with a pen because I didn't have a calculator, and I think I got it up to eighty-six percent that were against uh, the placement of the statue in that place and most of them in any other place in Oak Bay. But referring to the suggested spot for the sea, sea or statue, I have two safety concerns. We live in a world of selfie takers and if Stanley Park's experience with their scuba diving girl on a rock is anything to go by, we would have tourist buses backed up in the summer on a curve which creates all sorts of traffic problems. Second safety concern, I went and had a look at where this would be installed, and there is a big blocky sort of plinth already that is part of the stairway that goes down either side, and there's a railing on it. At the back of that platform, it's a sheer drop of at least, I would think, 12 feet, maybe more. 
And I envision um, ecstatic children running to climb on a slippery bronze statue after a shower and falling to only to be injured or perhaps worse. I don't know how you would prevent that happening. This stretch of Beach Drive, as others have said, sandwiched as it is between two parks that already have sculptures, needs no further embellishment. As the statue is the subject, or going to be, going to be the subject of a fantasy story for children, I would like to suggest it be located in a playground, maybe Fireman's Park, or I heard today that there might be a water park at Carnarvon. I think that would be ideal. Then there's plenty of space for selfie taking without backing up traffic, and families would enjoy it. A large plaque could spell out the fictional backstory. It might encourage children to become art connoisseurs in later life. The donor wanted something whimsical that would make people smile, and this would please many families and walkers who go to parks. It might become as beloved of generations to come as is the Peter Pan statue in Kensington Park, London. For future donations and the Arts Alive winners, could we earmark a piece of municipal land for a permanent sculpture park? The 10 entries each year could rotate through it and a predetermined number of places could be there for permanent acquisitions. This would make it so much easier to gracefully accept donations from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minus. Does anybody else wish to come forward to speak on any issue? Uh, my name is Geraldine Pete. I'm a longtime Moak Bay resident. I did write um, to you uh, earlier in the year uh, against this proposed Octavina sculpture. Um, the only thing that has changed is not putting it on the rock in the bay. I still do not um, agree with putting this statue up on the Oak Bay waterfront. It would still compete with and distract from the iconic views of this bay. It is still a, a historically false, made-up folk tale with an unpleasant storyline. How would you explain this story to a child or an overseas visitor? I just think it's a very, um, it's not a very nice story, and it's not uplifting. Uh, I really am against it. Um, the donor is being very generous, and I do appreciate that. Um, could he be persuaded to change his legacy gift to something else in his memory? Uh, for example, an ongoing bursary or scholarship at the Oak Bay High School. I know that he wants to leave a legacy, and I really do appreciate, appreciate his generosity, but perhaps it could be um, changed uh, to something else. Um, Mayor and Council witnessed the traffic problems created on this busy roadway with the beach trimaran on the rocks earlier this year. If you insist on putting this sculpture on the scenic Oak Bay Waterfront Drive, why not put it where there's already a traffic pullout? I drove along the um, waterfront the other day and there is a pullout uh, at the Victoria Golf Course at the crest of a hill. And there's also the Gonzales Hill King George Terrace overlook where there'd be lots of room uh, for tour buses to be pulling in and not blocking the traffic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pete. Anybody else wish to come forward? We'll take talks about things other than bronze statues too. It's allowed, everybody has. Anybody else have anything wish to come forward? All right, in that case, we'll end up our public participation period. Thank you very much, everybody who came and spoke to us. Uh, much appreciated. We are on to item number four, which is a request uh, from the World uh, Geronimo Canoe Club for some financial assistance for the World Distance Outrigging Championship. Um, should I turn to uh, Ms. Varela to, or someone to give a quick overview? This is just essentially a grant application request from the Canoe Club. Is, I think it's a pretty straightforward ask. Perhaps we get a motion on the table and we can talk to it. I'd like to move the recommended motion. Second. Which is to approve $500 for the, uh, any discussion. 
I would say I just make the observation that it's really not in compliant with what we usually do for our grant funding pieces, but I think it's important as part of our reconciliation uh, efforts and, and efforts to to, uh, to support our, our First Nations partners and, and uh, neighbors. So, uh, we'll see no further comments, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Then opposed. Thank you very much. Oh, if they could all be that quick. Uh, item number five, Sealor Sculpture, consideration of location. Uh, so we have a report from uh, Director of Corporate Services on this item and uh, just with the option of uh, approving a, a location for uh, a donated piece of art. I will, we've had obviously a number of people come forward and speak to this item and, and there is a, a fairly substantial amount of, uh, of correspondence in here as well. Um, so really at th this point it's really to approve or not approve. There's a couple of comments made um, that I think I'd just like to address very quickly on this one. One, uh, our job is here is really not to judge the art so much as really looking at uh, whether we consider this as a permanent location, although I would say the scale of the art would, ref would be reflected in this ask because um, obviously it does have an impact on the on that site. And it's a, um, I'd also probably just like to point out that uh, the, our ability to, to negotiate in this case is sort of limited. We have a, we have a very generous offer from a donor uh, to offer to pay for a piece of art uh, that was, he did not select the art that was selected by the, by the arts committee uh, as it's done through most of our adjudication process. And was that? I think he had input into I it. I believe though. he had input into it as well, yeah. So uh, he approved it, and uh, and it's now before us. As, uh, and it just he wanted it along the stretch. So it's really up to us whether or not we approve the site or not. It would essentially determine whether or not we accept the art or not. Councillor Zelka, um, to open discussion, if I may, um, uh, if there is an option for us to um, maybe just treat the the piece of artwork as we do all of our artworks every year. Where it gets put into the uh, the uh, is it ten items or twelve items that that get uh, adjudicated by the uh, the arts um, uh, group, and then uh, of the ten or twelve items that are basically uh, throughout Oak Bay that they, we already have plinths already set up, and then through that process th th we already have an existing process where they get ad essentially adjudicated by the public, and then the one that's the favorite or the top two we we potentially buy. Um, I mean, I, I, I really wish that this piece of artwork could just simply go right into the normal process as opposed to being treated outside of our existing procedures. I understand that it's coming to council asking for a special procedure and that's sticking in my craw a bit. I don't understand why we need to do that. So I want to ask the question uh, th to you or through you to staff um, or if necessary to, um, to our um, uh, our arts uh, committee, arts, arts, arts folks, whether uh, uh, the process uh, could be followed as we do for all of our pieces of artwork. Is, is that an option that we could consider? I think I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Adams to come forward if you're willing to do so on this. This is, this is we've had a, this is a very different process for the ones that are the, the rotating artwork that are selected and the ones that are donated. There's been a number of pieces that have been donated. Yes, it's live now. Is it so on? It is on. So uh, welcome, Ms. Adams, who is the, thank for those you. in the audience, the Arts Laureate. Thank, thank you. Uh, the process is diff different. Arts Alive is a call to artists, and artists submit a piece uh, to, uh, to be uh, considered for, uh, for exhibition. Uh, if they wish their piece to be considered to vote on, that piece has to be worth $18,000 all in at the most. Uh, so uh, this, piece of, this piece of art could not be considered because it did not answer that call. Uh, we do have, um, uh, we have talked about, we had talked about and is I believe in the uh, in the public art policy that people can donate a, p a piece of art which would then come to the public art committee to see whether uh, and of course parks and public works because it has to be te technically sound it would have to be able to withstand the weather and be safety uh, safety proofed and all of that so uh, then uh, if a piece was going to be don don donated that someone already owned, it would have to go through then the process 
would it fit in our community? Would it be safe? Uh, and then the the donor would um, he would get a t he or she or they would get a tax receipt, but they would also have to contribute ten percent of the val value uh, for installation and upkeep. Uh, this process, uh, this don donation, this very generous don donation by someone who loves Oak Bay, was different in that he he wished to uh, give something of joy to the community because he has had a lot of joy uh, out of the community. He is well traveled. He's been in many art places around the world and a lot of communities around the world and can see how public art has enhanced the community. Now, of course, public art is, each piece of art is not liked by everybody. Uh, and um, uh, uh, in part of the letters and things that I know you received, though I uh, scanned through them today, um, uh, there was one that came in and uh, for, for me uh, really mentioned, couldn't say any better uh, what, uh, what We've, what is felt about art. Art is never meant to please everyone, but rather be a free expression of someone's emotions, feelings, and creativity. Everyone has talents, talent being perceived differently depending on the viewer. You don't have to like it, but disliking it does not give you the right, in my opinion, to decide whether or not the public display of such a piece should or should not be. You always have opinion uh, you always have the option to look the other way. I don't personally like this form of art, but some folks might, and it's okay to be displayed for their enjoyment. Uh, and uh, they then gave their opinion that they found the argument about a specific piece of art uh, more offensive than the art itself. Uh, as far as... Uh, the choosing of this piece of art, it, uh, the donor was part of the uh, group, which, in, which also included people from the art gallery. It, we received 32 submissions. Those submissions were all looked at for uh, artistic val value uh, and the criteria in the call, which did include, which did include uh, something to bring a smile to the face, uh, to one's face. And it also uh, went through a uh, rigorous look by Parks and Public Works for safety and uh, sustainability. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Got if I may take this opportunity for one more question. Please do. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for, for the, um, uh, providing all this wonderful information and, and being such a resource uh, to Council on, on this difficult uh, this difficult question, or is least difficult for me. Um, uh, one uh, um, po possibility, if this could be a temporary installation, I, I would tend to be personally more in favor of it so that we could try it out, so we could see whether it actually was a safety issue, so we could see how many kids were actually being hurt per, per year falling off of this thing, to see whether someone knocks the head off, God forbid. You know, just to find out, you know, uh, mm -hmm. will, will it put up with the, with, with the wind? Uh, I don't know, or the weather. Uh, I, I'd like to ask whether the possibility of it being a temporary installation, similar uh, to what we do for our other uh, I'll actually jump in there, just that I think it's, well, we need first to find a, a home for it and second of Sorry. all we we own we will own both the art and the location so we have every opportunity of changing our mind at future times should we decide to do that there's right. nothing we're doing here that would bind council this council or future councils from changing our mind about the location if i may add some something uh with your permission Go ahead, uh i i just uh, wanted to say that the the base and the location uh, and the safety part of it will will be engineered. We have an engineer who's worked on the on the base to make sure that it would be sustainable. Uh, I, th I believe you saw the drawings of the base in the last uh, 
uh, go go round. They would apply to this location as well. And uh, of course, parks and pub public works will be uh, part of making sure that there will be a, uh, it will be safely, uh, you know, barring if somebody wants to jump over the railing. I mean, that's not something that we can police against. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, if I may, oh. just the last question then. Please. I threw you to staff, maybe Director of Engineering, with respect to safety. Um, is there an intention uh, to fence off this item? Or if we do find that there, uh, I presume there'll be a sign to say, do not climb. But uh, if that sign is not being um, respected, is there, what controls will be in place to keep people from, because that, that was one of the big concerns that I have as well as I heard some of the public say around safety and uh, the potentials for fall, especially falling from this plinth on the far side. It is quite a distance. And uh, so a question through you just to, uh, to staff, how will we keep this safe, especially if, if kids are climbing on it? If you can answer the how, please do so. If you can just, if not, then you, perhaps you can answer if you would keep it <laughs> safe. Uh, well, well, through you, Chair, I have uh, engineering services at this time, myself or anybody, ha haven't been asked this question yet, so it's not something that I can weigh in this, like at this moment with an answer. It would be something that we need to take away uh, and look at and come back with an answer. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, uh, Patterson, I think, had her hand up first, and then Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess... When, in considering this, certainly Can my you speak up a little bit yeah, higher. My preference would be, um, you know, I recognize what so many have said, and that the, the, the I recognize, like many others, the shoreline in Oak Bay is is a is a very precious thing to the community, and the the natural shore, shoreline is greatly appreciated. The difficulty I have with the installation, particularly having. Um, attended the um, BC Heritage Conference in Nanaimo in May um, was that a lot of the roundtable discussions we were having about um, inclusive and greater diversity and voices in the communities. We start all of the council meetings recognizing that we are on traditional lands and I think in in sensitivity to that, we need to hopefully find also a way to bring a more diverse discussion to matters of installations on the shoreline. So I'm concerned about the precedence this sets, um, again, for individuals by donating a piece that we then must find a home for um, is, is a a difficult road to embark on, and I don't know how we contain that in a way going forward. Um, so I would very much like to see Council perhaps come up with a policy for um, installations of any type on the shoreline um, on, and going forward. So I have difficulty supporting this location for this piece of sculpture. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. I just wanted to get a, a clarification. I think I heard you say, Mr. Mayor, um, that um, the statue and location are owned by us, the municipality, so could be moved by us, the municipality, at any time. Is that correct? I can see no reason why we would not be allowed to move our own art on our own property. So my concern there, then, would be that if the donor has um, is donating a statue and and we have said it's going in this location and they think it I mean it, they, are they under the assumption that it's going to stay in that location for perpetuity or are they aware that that location could be changed at any time because I would hate if I was the donor um, and had donated something like that um, and thought that it was going to stay there and then I pass away and then after I pass away that statue gets moved I I'm just wondering if he's aware of that or not uh, Ms. Adams, go back to well, uh, we haven't we haven't crossed that that bridge, but we did we did talk about the, the idea that when he donates this piece to uh, the municipality, the municipality then has ownership, 
And if it did become a safety issue or any other issue, that would have to be dealt, dealt with. Um, uh, Just a follow-up question, if I may, Mayor? Absolutely. Um, so what I think I heard you say was that um, he understands that once the statue is donated to us, that it's our property. So does that mean that he's going to donate it to us and then allow us to choose the location for it, or he's donating it to us with the assumption that the location will be the location that's attached to this proposal? Uh, I believe that he he believes it's, it is attached to, to this location. However, what I am also adding is that if it did become a problem, that's another issue. And uh, I, in other words, we couldn't change the location without uh, good reason, without sound reason. Well, I don't think that's what I heard the mayor say, though. Well, there's a difference between you can't or you shouldn't. I think that's uh, a... uh, Well, I'm not, I don't have any power in this decision. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're trying to reflect the wishes of the of the donor in this case of, of considering a siting on this land. Yes. And if, if it, my understanding is if it's not somewhere along this sort of somewhere along Beach Drive and this sort of walk that it would not be not be considered as a as a donation, but and that's his his choice to make. But it is not I guess my point is it doesn't bind our hands in, in the future. There's, there's we do own the property and the mm -hmm. and the balance. Councillor Appleton? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I, I can't support the placement of the sculpture in its current location. Uh, and it has nothing to do with, as, as you noted and as others have noted, uh, it has no, I, I make that decision not based on, on the artwork itself, the quality or, the, uh, or the, the nature of the artwork at all, but the fact that we don't have uh, a defined process and policy for dealing with donations of this nature, and, and I appreciate the work that the that the arts uh, committee does, and and we have lots of knowledgeable people that support uh, our decision making through that. Um, but I think that the fact that we're dealing with this here, and it and it keeps popping back up at council, reveals the fact that we don't have a, a strong policy to follow. Uh, we have a finite amount of public space in Oak Bay. Uh, and so I think it's reasonable for us to uh, tread carefully when we're talking about the placement of uh, infrastructure. And infrastructure is not the right word here because that I don't, I don't mean to demean the value of art because it has a value all of its own. But we, we literally have only so many placement locations for these types of works. Uh, the Arts Alive pro program is, is significantly different in the sense that it's there temporarily. We have plinths that everybody sort of knows this is where the art is going to be happening. Uh, so I, I and, and I also echo the comments of Councillor Patterson with regards to that there's a strong opportunity for, for reconciliation here uh, in conjunction with the habitat on the foreshore. So I, I just have pretty strong reservations about that one specific location and just the fact that we don't have a strong uh, accession policy, for want of a better word, for donated works of art and where they might go. Uh, to go to Council Green in a second, I, if, uh, Ms. Adams, we've had other pieces of art donated. My understanding was that those donations came to this body and we approved the location at that time, like the one in the centered uh, centered garden. Has that been a process that we followed in the past? Um, yes, we've had, uh, is this on? Um, we have had uh, several pieces don donated. Uh, the um, uh, gardener's gown by Bev Pet Petto, as you say, in the scented garden. Uh, the Bodhi frog on uh, Willows Beach uh, by the Clog fam family. Uh, and uh, we've had. Uh, then we have had uh, the Salish Sea, which is a First Nations piece, a beautiful First Nations piece on t Turkey Head. That was uh, donated uh, in part by the community. And over half of the pa payment for that came from, from people from the community who wanted the piece. Uh, the uh, hunt, the wolves and the deer, uh, that came from a don donation uh, from a don from uh, over half from uh, the community again, and also uh, uh, a ten thousand uh, uh, dollar one time grant from the previous uh, government. Um, also. Uh, 
I, it's a I think... comprehensive enough list, I think. Anyway, I yeah, just for, for my clarification on the on the Bodhi frog one on on I don't remember that process. Was that in that permanent? That was a temporary. Piece it, that was was a, it was a it was a temporary donated. piece, and then after the voting, it wasn't uh, chosen, uh, but it was uh, well loved by um, by someone along who lives along there, and they purchased it. Uh, uh, well, first of all, they asked if they could don't 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 donate it, and it had to be. We looked at it and made you know we had made sure that it was uh, safe and. Uh, would last a long time, and then uh, that was okayed. So uh, okay, I'm just I'm trying to get my head around what process we followed in the past. So it's so that uh, the, the what the what uh, what process uh, what happened in this process? As a matter of fact, the uh, intent was to have um, the final three of. Uh, that came uh, that that were chosen in the in the uh, in jurying uh, in the jurying process from the 32 to be put into uh, to be uh, examined by the by the community. However, uh, Parks and Public Works felt that two of those pieces, uh, when they looked at the maquettes when they were done were not going to be suitable for longevity. Okay, thank you. So that came down to one. The Council Green. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I appreciate the comments of my colleagues and also the, the work uh, that you do through you, Mayor, to, to Ms. Adams, the work you do with your committee. And I think the Arts Alive program is an amazing program for Obey and has provided tremendous um, a great asset to the community. But this particular issue has generated so much negativity and I am concerned about that only because I think the Arts Alive program has, program has achieved so many positive things for the community over the past years. And I don't want its credibility tested or challenged because of one installation or or one issue that we haven't been able to resolve satisfactorily. So I guess those are my concerns primarily following on the comments of my colleagues. But this should be a positive experience and it should inspire the community. Um, and that's my concern. Thank you. Uh, can I speak to that? Go ahead, Ms. Adams. Um, I, uh, I just want to say, um, uh, uh, first of all, the um, uh, the sculpture itself, I believe, will be a uh, a good sculpture. It, I believe that uh, yes, there was some uh, thought that the uh, there would be a legend that or a lore that would go, a story that would go along with it. For for me, art is art, and uh, I knew I do know that the school classes have been using or the te teachers have been using some of the art uh, around for writing purposes and critical thinking purposes. And I feel that uh, this piece uh, would be of benefit to that, for, for that, for, for, for sure. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm a little worried the, um, the maquette was really never put in public view and uh, the maquette has changed since the photograph that has been widely widely uh, distributed uh, has changed. In other words, it went back to the original face that was on the sculpture when it was juried. In other words, it doesn't have the surprise look. It has a demure look and uh, it makes the it, uh, it makes the uh, effect of looking at the sculpture much dif different than the than that widely distributed photograph. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a little dismayed about that. But having said said that, I know that the council will uh, make the decision that has to be made, and uh, I would I, w I would really like to uh, say that. Honoring uh, honoring the donor is uh, is an important thing to me, uh, and the, his generosity and his intent. 
uh, I think that because the community would own the sculpt sculpture, we'd initially would have its final, uh, you know, control. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, uh, Councilor Zelka for another time. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you uh, to um, uh, staff and our arts laureate. Um, um, so I, I, I can't support this location where it's being proposed uh, on the waterfront. But I do want to ask, um, um, uh, with respect to, to uh, the inspiration comment, um, so many of the other pieces of artwork uh, that have come through your wonderful arts committee and the Arts Alive program um, uh, bring such, uh, some such love and such inspiration to the community. And, and, and part of that is the context. And that's really one of the issues I have with, the, with this particular item. I don't feel the context is appropriate. So I, I, it, to me, there's a dissonance that's not working. Uh, but I do want to ask, with respect to context, um, uh, and I, I, I thought some of the ideas brought forward by the public were, were quite fascinating. Would the um, proponent, or maybe if we, if we said that we'd be fine to, uh, to put it, for example, at the Carnarvon uh, Rotary Water Park, in a situation such as that, I mean, somewhere near water, but also at the same time in a safe place, uh, 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 something that would bring joy certainly to the children, would the, um, would the proponent or the, the donor be suitable with something like that? Uh, I did, uh, we did, we, we did, we have talked to alternative lo locations uh, when the rock was not available. Uh, we, di we did talk alternative locations and he would like it, uh, he would, prefer or would uh, want it to be on the sea, seashore. He feels, and it is a unique piece, and uh, I, you know, so. Thank you. Any other comments, conversation? I'll just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to, to support the application. I think at the end of the day, getting generous donations like this are, are few and far between and the fact that we do have ultimately control over it if it's not uh, seen to be an appropriate location once it's in I um, I think that that overweighs it for me and I think the positive aspects of, of the art uh, overweighs it I I do hear I think I'm hearing a majority who are saying they're not comfortable with location and I, I do hear the I think the desire to have more uh, collaboration with our First Nations partners and finding art places like we do for the Salish Sea is, is, is a good policy to have. And certainly I think cleaning up our policies for art along the shoreline is a, is a very good one. Um, so unless there's any further comment, I'll call the question on, on the recommendation. Oh, do we have a motion? Okay, well, can I get a... Your Worship, there's no motion on Yeah, no, on that's fine. Table. So uh, I need a motion. If I may move the motion that uh, council consider placing this at the Carnarvon Water Park. So option number, so I don't have the option number two. Okay, so so uh, prove it if it's if it's located at the Carnarvon Water Park. Okay, so we have a seconder for that. Nope. I'll, I'll okay. second that so we can discuss. Okay, I don't want to discuss this very long. So, <laughs> if uh, is there any, uh, I mean, the, the motion is uh, to approve the location of this at the Carnarvon Water Park if the donor agrees to that location. Any any further discussion, Councillor Appleton? Uh, thank you, Worship. I I was uh, thinking that something related to that might work better, just in the sense of potentially approaching the donor and essentially uh, coming to a decision point by r asking the donor whether or not they would be willing to donate the sculpture provided that its placement was at the discretion of the district. And then, you know, as, as unfortunate as that is, unfortunately that does put us in the position of essentially saying uh, to the donor, who we all acknowledge as being extremely generous in this regard, uh, that they need to be comfortable with the idea of donating the sculpture in that context rather than, you know, that they, unfortunately, that they, you know, they we're more than happy to receive the sculpture and, and, and we think that it is an a very generous donation, but that as a district, we still need to exercise some control over placement. Um, is that an amendment to change the wording? I don't know whether I can amend the amendment. It's <laughs> amend not an that amendment, that, it's a motion right now. Yep. You can amend it to, to, to that wording. Okay, then I would propose an amendment uh, to Councillor Zelka's motion that... Uh, 
instead of proposing the location at Carnarvon Park to approach the donor to ask they, whether, well, to essentially communicate from council that donation of the sculpture would be contingent on council's decision making as to location. And I'd be fine to second that. I'm just going to turn to Mr. Jones. Your Worship, I just want to be, uh, that totally changes the intent of the original motion, so. Then um, the concept of a friendly amendment. I'd be fine to also withdraw my what, motion. You are willing to withdraw the second or willing to withdraw the motion? So we have a withdrawal of that motion, then we have a fresh motion on the floor. Uh, if you could maybe, should I get to staff just to kind of come up with the with the wording that would be appropriate here? Is that, no, I'm getting an eye roll. <laughs> Councillor Appleton, would you restate the... Uh... <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> uh, I would like to make a motion to uh, direct the, uh, well, I suppose it would be to uh, direct staff to work with the Arts Laureate to approach the prospective donor of the sculpture uh, to communicate that receipt of the sculpture or that, that, that council, it, it's a council's intent that the donation of the sculpture be contingent on council having discretion on its placement. Fundamentally second. Okay, so That's we can fine tune that wording as we... Your Worship, absolutely, we get, uh, okay. we get the point. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Apple, or Councillor Breathwaite. <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, this is so hard because it's a decision where the juxtas juxtaposition of the um, community interests and the donor's desire where um, neither dominates over the other, I think, you know, and so we're kind of put in a really tough position. I really want to, I really want to honor what the donor is, is doing and the desire of the donor to bring a piece of artwork to us, but I also want to really, um, on the other side, put the community interests at the forefront as well. So I'm hoping that this will be very um, um, uh, uh, agreeable to the donor because honestly, I, I, I truly believe that this piece of artwork would do much better at a place like Carnarvon Water Park or another park where children could be able to touch it and feel it and do whatever with it. So my hope is that the, that the, uh, the donor will be in agreement with this. So uh, I'll be voting for the motion. I'm going to let Councillor Nay speak and then Councillor Green. Uh, this is to the motion. Just very quickly. Um, I, I mean, I, I appreciate what's being put forward here, um, Councillor Appleton, and um, to come up with something that will work given the conversation that's unfolded here at the table. But one of the things we do need to recognize, I'm sure it's on the minds of everybody, is that there is a risk that we lose the piece of the donation, of course. And so what it brings to my mind is that it's really, uh, we really need to get our house in order here in future because we've led this process, we've allowed it to unfold for some time now with an understanding that we just haven't quite got the right place and now we put a motion like this and it, it may be the best we can do right now, but I, I don't think it's a fair process for somebody who's, and, and for our committee, our arts committee, who's done all this work to get it to this place uh, as well for any prospective donor. So, so I hope that we can work with the commission or somebody to come up and refine that arts policy in this regard. Thank you, Councillor Nate. Councillor Green? I would echo those sentiments. I, th I think we do need clear policy so there's clarity for the, for the Arts Committee and clarity for the community. I think this is a good motion. It, it tries to establish some middle ground and it, it's always difficult when it's an either or situation and I think this is a real, a, a sincere attempt on the part of Council to find middle ground for this issue. And we are very grateful for the very generous donation that we've received and all the work that the Arts Committee has done with the donor to make this possible. So I think that's an important message that, that the donor needs to know how much, how grateful we are. Uh, thank you. Seeing no other discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed on that. So we have that going forward. Thank you. Um, let's go through a few things. Procedure. We have a, is our cutoff at 10 o'clock here? 1030. Okay, so let's try and get through this before then for sure. Item number six, advisory design panel minutes. Need a motion to receive? Move receipt. Moved. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Unopposed? Number seven, uh, advisory de design, advisory planning commission minutes. Motion to receive minutes of advisory planning commission. Uh, yeah, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, can we just get a seconder Very first? Quick. 
sorry. Okay, moved and seconded. Yeah. Go ahead, Councillor Nair. I, I do notice on the the minutes here uh, that have just disappeared uh, that um, sorry, there was something brought up about the regional um, contact statement, and that there were two items that. Um, that that are going to require some changes as I understood in ROCP and that's food systems and climate action which we haven't yet addressed so I I, I mean I, I I thought that was interesting and I think it is something that uh, we do need to take seriously so I'll look forward to I'm not sure how staff intends to bring that forward but I'll look forward to seeing those and that we work together to formulate some priorities around both those items thank you Councilor Nee I don't want to have a long debate about this. <laughs> Councilor Zalka, go ahead. Uh, my question was also about the regional growth strategy, and I'll extend oh, okay. the comments I heard and ask you through you to staff if they could uh, please uh, comment on uh, not only those two items, but also some aspect of a public hearing process. W what, what is that about, please, and what's being proposed here? Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jensen. Well, you were going to hear all of this from me at the next council meeting, but I'll do a summary now. Um, essentially, with the adoption of the regional growth strategy, which council saw in 2018, um, we now have to update our regional contact statement in our OCP to match the new regional growth strategy. As Councillor Ney pointed out, uh, there are now two new sections of the uh, regional growth strategy relating to food security and to climate change. Uh, we do have some general policies in the community plan right now, so we're not um, at this point proposing to add any new um, additional policy into the OCP. I think that's something that to be considered a later date with, with some of Council's direction. Uh, at this point in time, what we're doing is updating those other five sections that are already in the context statement, as well as pointing to some of the policy that we already have in the community plan. So we've been working with CRD staff to prepare that regional contact statement or the update to it. Uh, that will be coming to your next council meeting. And uh, should council give the, the bylaw to update that contact statement, first and second reading, then we send it over to the board for the, for the regional district. If they accept it, then it comes back to Oak Bay for a public hearing process. Good, thank you. Any other qu comments, questions? Okay, all those in favor of receipt? Opposed, not opposed, thank you very much. Um, before I get too far ahead of myself, item number eight, Heritage Revitalization Agreement 2031 Runnymede Avenue, waiting patiently here. Uh, yes, we did. Um, so this is, I, I have to procedurally actually split this, my apologies to the applicants who are here. Uh, we'll ha first have to, because this was uh, left as an open piece, uh, there's three aspects of this. Um, the second you really have to come down under the um, resolutions part of our agenda for consistency. So I'm just going to ask that we, at this time, rescind the second reading of 2031 Runnymede Avenue. Uh, and then we'll Move to rescind. We'll consider the other second. two parts later. Moved and seconded. Um, this is the second reading that was done in 2018. We're just going to rescind this and allows us to discuss the second reading at the as, as procedural piece. Yeah, so in, under the resolutions, so we'll just move these rest to the resolution section, the, the next two pieces, if that's okay. Sorry for the confusion here in the, in the piece. So um, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Unopposed? We'll deal with the other two aspects of that, of the uh, consideration of second reading and setting a public hearing date under the resolution section of the agenda. Um, we don't need to formally receive correspondence, I don't believe, no. So we're just on to new business and verbal reports. Um, new business. Councillor Zelke, you, you mentioned that you might want to do a uh, notice of motion on on the possibility of, of re-looking at the sec or, um, duplex zoning. Uh, th thank you, Chair, but I, 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 I first, a question on procedure. Uh, with respect to item number eight, are we finished or are we actually? No, it's just I'm splitting it so that the second two portions of that are going to be moved to the resolution ah, section just thank after you this very portion. Much. So then at this point, we're noticed in new business. Yes, we're starting so, new business. So uh, yes, I would like to move a uh, notice of motion, please, with respect to the uh, adding the uh, Strata plans are not allowed under RD1, and I will supply the wording to staff uh, for the next council meeting. It doesn't have to be the next council meeting, but future council meeting. Just A future council give meeting. Give yourself some wiggle room there. Thank you Thank for that you. notice. Uh, any other uh, new business? Seeing none, I um, 
there's nothing substantial to report on the Kappa Regional District uh, at this time, so I'll leave that alone. And um, is there any other uh, verbal reports? And I'll I'll go Appleton and around if that's okay. Sorry, okay. Councillor Appleton. <laughs> <laughs> That's the advantage of being first on the alphabetical order list. Um, I will just provide a very, very brief update, um, given the hour. Uh, after our last, the day after our last council meeting, I was pleased to attend uh, the library board meeting uh, as uh, as trustee. Uh, the most salient piece of information that council should hear is that I was pleased to be able to pass along uh, our approval of my motion brought forward to advocate for greater funding for libraries. Um, we were ahead of the curve on that one. Everybody was talking about uh, who was going to be the next one to do it, so I was very proud to be able to walk in and say that ours had been done the night before, so thanks very much to Council for your support on that. That initiative is gaining, from what I understand, a great deal of momentum, so it was uh, it was very well received, and I think uh, it should, uh, have a very strong message is, is going to go forward. Um, the other uh, piece of information that we did discuss there that would be of interest to Council would be some advocacy that's happening under uh, on access to electronic journals, uh, and this fits in with just my ongoing uh, uh, sort of uh, Im impression of the professionalism of the library system uh, that we support. Uh, there was a discussion around the ongoing, just the, the 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 ongoing discussions that the librarians have to have as far as the access to digital publications, licensing for those things. Um, it's extremely complex and it's a constantly shifting uh, uh, playing field, and uh, they have constantly have to renegotiate contracts. And uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, the costs and the ongoing access to electronic publications for people who need them. So there's an advocacy campaign going on. Really Related to that, uh, which I think is is a real positive thing, uh, and that's I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Councillor Breathwaite. Um, yes, I just like to, it seems like so long since we we had a meeting where we can talk about things. So I'm trying to remember all the things that happened. But very quickly, just a thank you to uh, the Parks, Rec, and Culture staff for putting on a wonderful barbecue on the lawn of Municipal Hall um, on for Canada Day. It was a great celebration, and I think everybody had a wonderful time. It's always nice to be able to give out free food and uh, and um, chat with everybody who's who comes to visit. So that was wonderful. And we also had um, we also have coming up this week or oh, that. That night we also had some music in the park which was very well attended and this week we have a night market on Wednesday and music in the park again on Thursday so I hope to see everybody there Kelsey Green anything thank you it, it has been a long time I first of all we attended I attended with other council colleagues a great workshop that was put on by Deb Hopkins I think I don't think we've had a meeting since then have we um, on um, and thank you Deb for organizing that on freedom of information and protection of privacy which is always a bit scary but um, it, it was a really good webinar and I'm, I'm very grateful to Deb for doing that and then I attended uh, the tourist OPE tourism C committee meeting this week and that was very positive and it's that is a great group Hazel um, so and I see Michelle is here, and I didn't say that for your benefit, Ms. Lesage, but seriously, it's it, it's a very interesting group, and it, it, it's a fun group, and I, I learn a lot about our community through this affiliation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nee. Anything to... Well, I just mentioned uh, the uh, participating in the Pride Parade that um, the mayor invited all of us to attend, and some were able to, Councillor. Patterson was there, and it was a remarkable event. I, 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 there must have been tens of thousands. I'm not sure the number, but that event has got so big and so many people attending. Uh, it was very impressive, and the energy and uh, of people down there. It, it was, it was something to go to and be part of. So thanks for the invitation, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to say one more thing, if I may, on that, yeah. is I think it was quite clear to us that though we attended, we weren't particularly well prepared. We were kind of stealing little flags from our Saanich um, counterparts, but that we did have some kind of talk about next year, and we said we need to have Hazel there dressing us up. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll come back. Uh, Councillor Patterson? No. Uh, Councillor Zalka? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so in addition to um, the Oak Bay annual report, uh, which is out for comment, um, the uh, CRD water quality 
uh, Drinking Water Quality 2018 Annual Report is also out, and I encourage everyone to uh, read it and uh, hear all the wonderful things that, that CRD is doing with it for our, our water. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Green, you had something else to add? I did. I, I just wanted quickly to acknowledge the mayor and our set staff for p putting up the pride flag. I believe it was last Friday to commemorate Pride Week. I really appreciated that. Maybe more so because I donated that flag a long time ago, and it, it's wonderful to see it still flying over the, over the hall for these occasions. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Green, for that uh, donating that to the municipality. I just the a couple of things that might be just of interest to council was just uh, I did attend this the South Island Prosperity Partnership AGM and then the partners meeting, and there's some interesting work they're trying to do. Uh, post uh, not getting the uh, the, the federal uh, award, um, so, so, so there's some some things coming down the pipe. Um, I also had the um, uh, the pleasure of attending the uh, there's a mayor's uh, working group that's been working for a couple of years on on looking at oversight models for police governance of integrated units. So uh, under the Police Act, there's a requirement for civilian oversight of police. Um, uh, police departments, but integrated units that operate, you know, between things don't actually have a formal oversight body. So uh, there's been a fair bit of work going on over the last couple of years. Um, we've had now a, a series of meetings, and this time uh, the ADM and uh, Director of Police Services, Brenda Butterworth Carr, attended, and, and I think we're pretty close to coming up with some models that might work for us as a, as a region to provide some level of, 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 of civilian oversight. Um, some sort of mayor's uh, uh, board that would meet periodically. So that was very interesting and, and I think a good step for, for good effective uh, oversight and management. And the second is uh, the, uh, I think uh, we also had a mayor's lunch today, uh, which just we try to do reg on a regular basis. And we had talked about a wide ranging set of, of issues that affect the region, um, very positive. But one of them actually is that we're looking at just ha putting together a joint, uh, everything other than Victoria, uh, uh, float or gathering for the Pride Parade next year so that we don't have to kind of sort these things out individually. We can just kind of show up and, and be part of that. So uh, amongst uh, quite a few other more, probably more salient <laughs> and important issues. So I'll just summarize that. Uh, anything else under reports? All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for all the work that you do. We are uh, down to item number, just make sure I'm getting my numbers right because these with fifth, uh, right. So really, well, actually, we're really yeah, we're making, sorry, I'm going to go by the numbers. It's really uh, number eight of the HRA moved into the resolution phase. We'll call it number 15 on this uh, sheet. Yes, so number 15 for second reading is amended. So this is, um, so subject to our decision, so we've agreed to rescind the previous reading uh, to give second reading to 2031 Runnymede Avenue Heritage Revitalization Agreement. Uh, Ms. Jensen, this does deserve, I think, a little bit of a, a summary of how we got here uh, efficiently. <laughs> <laughs> All the pressure. So council previously considered this HRA uh, last summer, uh, gave it first and second readings at that time. Uh, public hearing was subsequently held in September. Uh, following that public hearing, the applicants have subsequently been reconsidering the application and are proposing some modifications to the agreement. Uh, the application is intended to still facilitate a two-lot subdivision. The existing heritage home would retain the secondary suite on one lot, and a new second lot to the north would allow for that second dwelling unit. It's exactly the same subdivision layout as what was previously seen by Council. Um, they are, however, now uh, advising that they're no longer requesting the siting for the detached garage that would go with the heritage home. They are removing the request for variances to site the uh, proposed dwelling unit on the on the new lot. That means that any new dwelling unit on there would have to meet the requirements of the zoning. Uh, it has also been revised to reflect uh, some other changes. So essentially, some of the wording has been updated to reflect legal terminology. The select variances, uh, as noted, have been removed from the agreement. And a variance that was mistakenly referred to as lot frontage, is actually lot width, has been revised to 18.7 metres instead of the rounded up 19 metres. Uh, at this point in time, Council can decide if they want to give it second reading and set a public hearing date. Okay, thank you. And, and for many people, this is still a fairly new uh, new viewing of this application. Um, are there questions of, of Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Chair, uh, through you to staff. Um, one of the questions I had relating to the last time this came before council, and maybe the same question is still there, um, uh, with respect to the um, uh, heritage revitalization, uh, you said that the house is to be uh, designated, but in 1980, is it? It was the house and lands that were designated. So I understand that the old bylaw is to be removed and the lands are being undesignated. Uh, but what's being done with the lands going forward? Well, at yes. this point in time, that designation by law uh, stands as it is. There's no change to the designation by law at this point. So the intention of this moving forward is that the lands would continue to be de designated going forward? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the current house lands, not the subdivided property lands. Uh, the designation bylaw uh, it refers to the entire lands right now, um, so it would it would affect both properties at this point. Okay, with less meaning on the second property, obviously, without structures to, to designate. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just if we could get clarification, um, does this um, HRA then restrict future subdivisions, and if not, what uh, process would be required in the future? Ms. Jensen? Uh, there is no clause in the revitalization agreement to restrict future subdivision. Uh, because this is an agreement, similarly with a no subdivision clause, those types of documents can always be opened up. So it's not necessarily something that my opinion would work very well. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Patterson? Uh, and just, um, I, I tried to do a lot of reading on this because uh, I, I don't have the benefit of having the, the background experience of the other members of council who um, viewed this the last time it came to council. Uh, just if you could comment on the siting of, of a new dwelling and the impact on neighboring properties. Ms. Jensen, I believe this has essentially removed the siting components of the application. It's essentially just saying it's a lot and we'll have to comply. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So if I may, the uh, again, the subdivision layout has not uh, changed from the previous uh, version seen by Council. So the subdivision lot lines, uh, interior lot lines, lot frontage remains as is. Uh, the applicant is proposing to remove the garage that's currently sitting on that second lot. That means that the new uh, dwelling would have to sit within the building footprint that would be provided through the through the RS4 zone. Thank you. Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, and just a few comments, if I may. I was sitting on the Heritage Commission at the time this first came forward, and there were a number of comments, m some of which have been addressed in Ms. Jensen's um, report, and through you, Mayor, to Ms. Jensen. Um, there were a number of points that the Heritage Commission at the time, I think some years ago, had asked about, and you've covered off some of them. Um, but there were, there were, uh, there was a concern, and they wanted protected the rock walls and features in the original statement of significance, to be included in an HRA statement of significance or agreement, and that the siting of the new house be resolved to minimize the impact on the shading of the adjoining neighbor's yard, which I think that has been achieved now with the changes. I believe is that correct? The shadowing issue is not. Ms. Jensen, I. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I, w I wasn't sure, I, but it sounded as though with the revisions that have been made and changes by the owner that maybe some of that would be minimized. Uh, well, again, depending on what came forward for that single family home on the new lot, they would be subject to the requirements of the RS4 regulations. Right. So they would still be restricted in terms of um, floor area, in terms of lot coverage, in terms of maximum height but it's difficult to know what that would look like depending on where it had ended up sitting on the lot and the size of the home. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Zelka? 
One last thing. I know I'm trying to be quick here. Uh, one thing that would help me uh, with this item going forward and would reduce many questions would be if um, when it finally comes to council uh, or public hearing and the whole process, if it's possible to see the original statement of significance that may be around the time of 1980 or whatever that is, yeah, uh, or maybe a, 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 the Stark description or maybe something that would be, um, would describe the value uh, that was being captured uh, with respect to the land and and uh, building designations back then. Um, I, I see that a lot of the uh, statement of significance, the more uh, up-to-date ones are being provided, but I would love to be able to compare the two, please. Do we even have this? Oh, you have it there, okay. Uh, if I may, we do have it. Uh, essentially, um, the original statement of significance for Blair Gowie, the, the heritage value itself, the wording has been updated, but the content is essentially the same. In terms of the character defining elements, uh, the, the applicant, uh, the, the, the consultant, the heritage consultant who was working for the applicant, they did remove two sections from the character defining elements. One of those being the interior features. Uh, as most of you know, there were the the designation bylaw did not contain any features uh, for the interior of the home and the applicants have spent a considerable amount of time updating the home so that section of the, the elements has been removed. The other section that has been removed did refer to the rock terraces. Um, I think there was some discussion at the time um, respecting the location of those rock terraces. Again, the applicant has done considerable works with the landscaping, so there are a lot of rock gardens in there. Um, whether that's considered the rock gardens or not, I think was the reason why that was removed. Okay, thank you. I think that will be a question, certainly uh, for the public hearing portion of it, but uh, it's consistent with the previous statement of significance that was in front of council. Uh, any other questions? I. I I just, I guess I will, I, I'm supportive of this going forward. I will say, I, from the interest of the community, I know there was a, a significant pushback at the last uh, uh, public hearing on, uh, on certain aspects, particularly of the, of the proposed house that was on the second lot, uh, concerns of shading and pieces. And I, you know, I, I think this is probably the safest way to go politically, but I'm not sure it's the best output from a, from a community perspective. I think the actual efforts made by the applicant last time to find siting of the house and, and, and making a much smaller house than would be legally allowed on the lot uh, actually provided a lot of benefit to the community and I, I'm sad to see that go frankly. I think that it was a nice, uh, it was a nice approach to, to managing that but I think this is at the end of the day probably the best course of action going forward and I'm supportive of it certainly going to public hearing. Councilor Green. Thank you. Um, I too am supportive in principle of, of this going forward but through you Mayor to Ms. Jensen. Um, has the Heritage Commission seen this new application, do you know, or is that part of the process now again or not? I'm sorry, I'm just, it's just a question because I'm not sure now. Would, would they have an opportunity to comment or not? Ms. Jensen? Uh, through you, Mayor. At this point in time, no, it has not gone back to the Heritage Commission. Again, the layout has not changed. Uh, what's what has been removed are pieces components that would not be subject to that that heritage consideration but council can certainly l look at referring that back if they chose to thank you so right now we're at sitting at first reading considering second reading of this application and certainly from a process perspective the intention here is that if it's a uh, we don't take comments from the from the audience at, on this process uh, Councillor Zelka. So, a question then, uh, in terms of pro procedure, if we were to refer this to uh, the Heritage, this would be the time to do it, I presume? Uh, it would. I think we have to be fairly specific about what we're asking them for. We've had it go to the like the heritage aspects of the application, so we're really looking at the primarily here the aspects of the of the second lot. Well, I'll defer to uh, the others more knowledgeable in heritage on the council on that one. I don't think it's it's harmful to ask staff opinion here. I mean, is is procedurally, I think you stated that it's not normally going through t to Heritage twice on this. Is there is there aspects of this that that you f that you feel would be w worth getting us an additional opinion on the on the Heritage aspects? 
I, is that, I don't need to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can take back that question. Well, there was robust conversation at Heritage Commission respecting the home itself. Um, everything to do with the home in terms of that agreement stays the same as is. Uh, one of the things that didn't go to the Commission with the original application was the siting of the proposed uh, detached garage to go with the home, but that has since been removed, so that hasn't changed from what the Heritage Commission originally saw. And again, to clarify, at this point in time, that designation bylaw does not change, so it's still protecting the lands and the building. Uh, so, like I said, Council can, can choose if they want to take it back to the Heritage Commission or you can stand as is with, with what they know already. They, they have seen uh, this property on multiple occasions for, for different aspects of the home. Um, but if Council wants more addition from the Heritage Commission or if they feel like they ha don't have enough information yet, we could certainly um, bring something back to Council before it goes to public hearing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing any motions. Uh, so if we're following the procedure here, if there's, again, if there's feeling that this has enough merit to go forward and, and be considered for public hearing, we look at the two motions uh, to give second reading and then set a public hearing date uh, proposed for September 9th. Uh, Councilor Green. Just very quickly, a question through you, Chair. Please. To Ms. Jensen, would it be possible to share the most current information, though, with, with the Commission? Um, not for comment necessarily, but just for information purposes, or yeah. or would that th would that be inappropriate? Uh, well, they have a meeting tomorrow night, so we can certainly give them the updated plan. Thank you very much, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, I'll make a motion to give second reading to twenty thirty one Runnymede Avenue Heritage Revitalization Agreement Bylaw Number four six nine six to enter into a Heritage Revitalization Agreement as part of the proposal to develop two single family residential lots at twenty thirty one Runnymede Avenue. And can I do both at once? Uh, I think no, no. We'll do them separately. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Then then uh, submitting, and setting a public I hearing. I will date. also um, move to set a public hearing on bylaw number four six nine six to be held at the Oak Bay Municipal Hall on September 9th, twenty nineteen, at six p.m. in Council Chambers, and that notice be given in accordance with the Local Government Act. Second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Councillor Zelka? Yes, I will try not to get caught in traffic for that public hearing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, all those in favor, opposed, not opposed. The last item on the agenda, good job sitting this out. Uh, we have uh, item number 16, development variance permit uh, for 1175 Beach Drive. This is for an awning re request. Yeah. Because oh, right. I own property at that right. place. Thank you, Councillor Name. So I will move the development variance permit DVP 00093-1175 Beach Drive. Second. second. Moved and second. Is there any discussion on this? I just want to point out there was one piece of correspondence uh, in, the, in the piece there. Uh, any other discussion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed? You have a new awning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Your Worship, as, uh, procedurally, you do need to invite public comment on this item. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just losing it's it this late. time of day. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm <laughs> sorry. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to the application at, uh, at Beach Drive? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, sorry. My apologies. I will call the question formally this time. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we need a motion. Uh, just before we uh, do adjournment, I just want to point out to anybody left in the audience, uh, there is an annual report, draft annual report that has been posted. You, uh, Councillor Zelka mentioned that, so this is the chance, and it'll be uh, reviewed at the Committee of the Whole next week, so that's a chance for public input on that item. So thank you very much. Uh, a question? Uh, yes. Uh, with respect to the, uh, to the annual report, can any member of the public speak about any item in the annual report for as long as they choose? Uh, it is going to a committee of the whole. I'm not sure I want to encourage anybody to come to the thing and speak as long as they want, but um, yes, I think within reason that would be the uh, that would be the, the the answer would be yes. Um, but we try to ask people to be respectful of time. Uh, I'll, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll to move that in camera? accordance with Section 91A and C of the Community Charter that the open portion of the meeting of Council be adjourned and that a closed session be convened to discuss personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, or agent of the municipality or another position appointed by the municipality and labor relations or other employee relations. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor. 
All those in favor? <laughs> opposed? Not opposed. Thank you very much, everybody, for sitting through a very long meeting with three minutes to spare. Uh, just a side note, Your Worship, uh, that if any comments or uh, if anyone has any comments for the annual report, staff welcomes those in advance prior to the meeting as well. So uh, written or verbal, email, anything anyone wants to provide, we'd gladly accept those comments in advance. Okay, thank you very much.